All right, San Diego and Southern California, what's going on? Hour one of John and Jim to answer Jim's question that he's asking me during his update that he didn't prepare me for. The answer is 14 was the ah. smallest margin for a UConn victory in this tournament. <laughs> it was in the final four. Got to keep you on your toes, man. Against Alabama. All right, Kyle Glazer, Baseball America, will join us in eight minutes. We will talk about the first two weeks of this season for the Padres, including last night, which was the complete reversal of everything from AJ's got to go in the first five innings to everything has changed. This is going to be a magical season. And here's why they just overcame. I love this team. Run. It was amazing. This I mean, team is amazing. what was interesting was you had, you had these two big sporting events locally. Obviously the Padres is always significant. If you're a Padres fan, then nationally, I mean, it is the men's national championship game. So I think there's some eyeballs there as well. And, you know, it's the middle of the evening and you're looking up, you're like, this basketball game is not great. This baseball game is terrible. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, the basketball game wasn't very great, but the baseball <laughs> game was the fact that the Padres came all the way back from eight, nothing down to win. Um, what do we make of it? I mean, it's obviously one game over 162. We didn't see much of that a year ago, but then again, it's not very, it's not every day you overcome eight run deficits. So is it going to mean more or not? Like, is this going to be highlight of the year, eight run comeback, or is this going to be the start of things to come? I don't know what it's going to mean. We'll find that out, but just taking last night's game in a phone booth or a vacuum, right? It was totally unexpected. I think anybody out there that said that they believed they were going to win that game when they were down eight, nothing in the, what the fifth inning or the no, sixth inning. going into the bottom of the sixth inning, you're either like lying yourself or maybe you truly did believe, but I don't think there were many people out there. That, Padres blogger believed I, that's one person. He always, no matter what yeah. the score is um, talking friars believe. No, he didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rich McGuire says he believes I'll people that left believe. Yeah, of course. They right. wanted to listen. Yeah, and watch. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm watching that game and, I, and then I started doing other stuff. I mean, eight, nothing. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to do other things. I had mm -hmm. the game on, but I, I just was doing other things. And, and that was one of those games that, you know, you'll remember for a while. And we were just talking about this during the break with Darren when you get to a point in that game where they were trailing eight, nothing, and then they make that comeback eight, seven, you have, you had to win that game. There, there was no other way that game could have ended, but with the Padres winning because nobody cares and nobody would care today coming into work with us and you guys out there listening to us and watching us on YouTube. Well, you know, that was a nice little comeback, but that eh, fell short. They still got the loss. Like, no, they had to win that game once they made a comeback and they got to eight, seven, and the player that did it, that completed the comeback, was so fitting. It wasn't, no offense to Tyler Wade, but it wasn't Tyler Wadey, right? It mm -hmm. wasn't uh, Graham Pauly. It wasn't Jackson Merrily, Action Jackson. It was your superstar player. It was one of the guys this year that needs to have a big season for this team and come up in big moments for this team. It had been cool and awesome, don't get me wrong, if... Jackson Merrill ended up hitting a go-ahead two-run home run in the eighth inning to get the Padres a 9-8 lead. But didn't it feel like with Tatis doing it, that's who should have done it? And that's that's like, hey, you're getting paid the big bucks. You need to go out there and perform. And your superstar player came up in the biggest moment. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's pretty storybook, especially when you consider the last couple of years for Tatis. It, it hasn't been ideal. And we've spent the better part of the offseason saying He's got to be 21 Tatis, and he's capable of being that player. And truth be told, I think he's been really good. He's been, I mean, that's a massive moment to come through in. He's already had a multi-home run game. He's already had four home runs in 13 games. So, yeah, let's see more of that. Now, a year ago, this is the issue with baseball. Darren has talked about this. We talked about it during the Fusion. We all can agree on this. The issue with baseball is... I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could mean a lot. We don't know what's going to happen over the next 149 games. They could be really good. They could be really average. They could be really bad. Are we going to circle this if they're really good? Maybe. Are you going to circle it if they're average? No. Are you going to circle it if they're really bad? No. Um, I do think there are differences right now between the 2024 Padres and 2023 Padres, even though they have identical records, if that makes sense. I just feel like they do have something a little more like fight 
it appears at least offensively, they didn't have a four run inning gym until game 28 last year. Hmm. They've had 10 innings of four or more runs this year. 10 is that good in 13 games. So to me, that's the biggest difference. Their offense, for whatever reason, I mean, it's not like all the pieces are different. For whatever reason, the offense has been much better than it was a year ago. It's about, you know, the players this year, while they might not be as good talent wise as last year's team. It starts with the players when this team, if this team wins this year, it's going to be because of the players. Mm -hmm. It's going to be because of the star players. It's going to be because of the pitching, right? You know, I, I, that's just, you know, maybe hit the brakes a little bit on. Well, if, if Bob Melvin was here, this team would have won, wouldn't have won last night's game. It's all because of Schilte. Um, I'm going to give the praise to the players on this one. I'm going to give the full 100% praise to um, Jake Cronenworth for having that nine pitch at bat last night in the sixth inning that resulted in a two run home run. I'm going to credit Jackson Merrily, Action Jackson. <laughs> Is it Jackson Merrily? It's probably just maybe Jack. Mary. I don't know. For his walk before, you know, the Tatis two run home run. Um, and also he got on base before the, I think he was on base with the Cronenworth home run as well. Dander Bogarts finally getting a big hit and not just this. I mean, Big time hit the two run home run to pull it within um, nine, uh, eight, eight seven. seven. Mm -hmm. And then Luis Campusano, Hassan Kim, like those are the players and those are the people that I'm crediting for last night's win. It's, n I, I am not going to sit here and say or start a narrative that because this team is different this year is because of Mike Schilt. Like this team will be different this year based on the performances of the players on this team. Yeah, I mean, I'll give him credit if at the end of the year they have a much better season than 2023. Because Absolutely, he'll definitely will, yeah. get blame if they don't. You know, if if they win 77 games and you know they're comparable to last year, if not worse, he'll he'll take some of the blame. Yeah. I mean, there's no question about it. I think. And by the way, I think Melvin got credit when they won in 2022. I think by and large, Melvin got a lot of credit. You know, it just happens that way. Yeah. Machado gets credit, he makes a lot of money. Machado gets blame, he makes a lot of money. Melvin's the manager, he gets credit or blame. Same thing's going to happen. I would think with Mike Schilt. I mean, I liked hearing from Schilt post game last night. I mean, Schilty? he, you know, if you if you listen to him post game last night, it, it sounded like they truly believe. Now, again, it's easy to say when you do it. I don't know what he would have said if they lost the game eight nothing. Hey, we believe we were going to win the game. That would have been laughable. It would if they it lost the game eight nothing. Have, but he yeah. said post game like, hey, listen, we've been doing things the right way. We're not giving away at bats. That's something he's absolutely preached since the season started and. It paid off. It really did in a big way. A 9-8 win. So let's welcome back Kyle Glazer to the show. Kyle has done such a good job, obviously, covering major and minor league baseball. Formerly with Baseball America, friend of the show. He's been with us a ton, obviously, over the years right here on John and Jim. San Diego Sports 760. So great to have Kyle Glazer back. Kyle, let's just start with last night. I mean, you know, this doesn't happen every day. I saw you retweeted something where the Padres, I think, have had four eight-run comebacks in franchise history in a win so what is it worth? I mean, are we going to look at this as a one-off or is this a sign of things to come or a sign of things we've seen so far from this Padres offense? Well, we'll see if they can keep the momentum going into the final few games against the Cubs and especially the series against the Dodgers. I will say what it is indicative of is how explosive this offense is. We saw last year's offense really be the Achilles heel for the Padres, the bottom half of the lineup, especially this year, again, it's still early, but entering today, they're tied for second in the majors and run scored behind only the Dodgers and tied with the Pirates. And I think what's most encouraging is we're seeing the guys at the bottom of the lineup really contribute. You know, guys like Jake Cronenworth, who struggled last year, he's off to a nice start. Jerks and Profar is having a good start. Jackson Merrill's had a nice start as a rookie. The Padres are doing this with Manny Machado and Xander Bogart just to really get rolling. It's, it's a good, good sign because the length of the lineup was a big question mark coming in. And so far, it's been a strength. You know, it is only, you know, the, the beginning of April here, Kyle. And for you, I know coming into the season, like all of us, like they need a bat, they need this, they need that. They still have holes on this team. Has your opinion, even though it's very early, has your opinion on this team changed even a little bit to say like, oh, maybe they actually do have uh, maybe enough pieces there and they can get maybe that one piece at the deadline? Or do you still think this team has some major holes on it? It's certainly been encouraging the way Jackson Merrill has played so far, both defensively and offensively. I think you look at center field as a potential big hole, especially when you consider how little time he had at double A last year. 
So far, so good. Again, there's going to be an adjustment period where the league adjusts to him. He's going to have to adjust back. We'll see how that goes. But I think coming in, you thought that was the number one position of need. Now you look at it and say maybe they might be okay. Again, it's still very early. There's a lot of baseball left to be played. Look, this is still a team that could use some help in their rotation depth. This is still a team that could use some bullpen help. And you can always use more bats. But at the very least, center field feels a little better today than it did coming into the season. Kyle Glazer with us right now on John and Jim. Kyle, tell me, what is this like? What does this mean? Is this Paulie move to the minors and Sullivan up from AAA? More about Paulie getting at bats as a young player, or is it about, yeah. or, or is it about Campusano getting opportunities to DH? But he's not going to with Manny Machado not in the field, right? It's mostly about you don't want to have a young player sitting on the bench when he needs reps. Graham Paul is a very talented hitter. Again, he barely had any time above the Class A levels last year, finished here in Double A. You don't want him pinch hitting every couple of days. You want him getting four or five at bats a day against upper level pitching, continuing to grow and develop as a hitter. That wasn't going to be happening in the majors. The right thing to do is to extend him down to the minors where he can get those reps. Uh, yesterday, we got a report out that Manny Machado might not be 100% until at least 2025. How, how big of a concern do you think that is going to be for this season? Because they're going to need a, 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 a productive Manny Machado at the plate. On the field, I don't think it's like the biggest concern, but if he's not going to produce at the plate because of this elbow injury and because it's not 100%, like that could be a, a big problem this year. What, what do you make of his his comments yesterday about his elbow? Look, when Manny Machado's healthy, he's one of the best players in the National League. We saw two years ago, he's the NL MVP runner-up to Paul Goldschmidt. Last year was a bit more of a struggle. There's a huge difference between Manny Machado at 100% and not. At the end of the day, there's no question. For the Padres to be the best team they can be, 100% is a big, big part of it. So hopefully he's able to get better sooner rather than later. But everyone's body heals differently. Every injury is different. We're just going to have to see how this one heals up. Should we expect, you know, is it just natural for Tatis to have the year he just had? He was coming off suspension and significant injury. It had been months and months before he had played. And, and last year there were ups and downs. But are you expecting this to be a massive, I'm not saying Acuna last year type bounce back, but are you expecting a top five type MVP season out of Fernando Tatis Jr.? I'm expecting a much, much, much better season than last year. You have to remember last year, he was coming off having not played in 18 months. He had three surgeries and was moving position. The fact he performed as well as he did is honestly kind of remarkable. Most hmm. players would have just completely fallen flat given everything he was going through. I think we're going to see him really take off this year again. Off to a nice start, had the big home run yesterday. Again, will he win the MVP award like Acuna? It's tough to go that far. At the same time, it wouldn't shock me if he has a big year and is at the very least in consideration. You mentioned Jackson Merrill earlier on. For you, how big of a um, I guess surprise or, you know, for him to be performing how he is right now, what, what do you make of that? And did you expect him to do this so early on? Well, I think with Jackson Merrill, one of the things that's always been really, really, really good about him is he adjusts very, very quickly. He puts in the work. He has great makeup. He's very fundamentally sound. He's a mature player. So you give him a lot of credit for making the jump he has. I certainly am surprised with how good he's looked in center field early. Again, has been perfect, but overall he's handled himself fine. And how good of at bats he's had early. Again, the gap between the pitching and double A to the majors is enormous. And really, class A to the majors is enormous. That's where he got most of his reps. So it's really impressive to see him make the adjustments as quickly as he has. At the same time, it's very early early. The league will adjust to him as they get more familiar with him, and it's about making those counter adjustments. But you have to be impressed with how he started. There's no question about it. Kyle Glazer with us right now, John and Jim, San Diego Sports 760. Kyle, what do you see as the differences in terms of managerial styles between Bob Melvin and now current Padres manager Mike Child? I think it's a little early to make any sweeping judgments on that. We're 12 games into Shield's tenure. Um, let, let's see how the year plays out how players respond to certain situations, how the bullpen is managed over a longer stretch. I think trying to make any such judgments two weeks in is, is premature. Uh, Kyle, this, this new pitching staff that the Padres have this year with Michael King, Dylan Cease, and then they put Matt, Matt Waldron in the rotation. How, how do you view this rotation as far as a whole, and how do you think it stacks up with the rest of the National League? It's a rotation that still has some question marks to the back. Again, you feel good about you, Darvish. You feel good about Dylan Cease. Joe Musgrove is off to a rough start, but you feel pretty confident he'll turn it around. 
Michael King's done a nice job keeping runs off the board. He's really, really struggled with his control. Matt Waldron really struggled in his first start against San Francisco. Uh, St. Louis bounced back nicely against San Francisco. The more he throws the knuckleball, the better he is. But uh, you certainly don't look at these two guys and say, oh, yep, we're good with our – these are our four or five starters. You, there's still some questions. They still have to show it and prove it over longer stretches. Neither of these guys have pitched a full season as a starter in the majors. So uh, it's still a bit of a question mark. When you look at this rotation overall, the top three, it, it stacks up very nicely with some of the best in the National League. But if you're looking at one through five, it's a little bit dicier. So I do think this rotation, we will find out more about it as the year goes on. The other issue is there's very, very, very little margin for anyone to get injured because there's not much depth that you feel good about waiting in AAA or or in the bullpen guys who can come up. They've added some of the Soto deal, Vasquez, Brito, and Drew Thorpe. But again, there's no one there that you feel great about coming up and making an impact right away. Kyle, what was your reaction to the Padres potentially as late as spring training being at least interested in a potential trade for Luis Arise? And I know the Marlins are one in ten, but even if Arise is moved wherever he's moved, you wouldn't expect it to be early in a season, would you? No, but AJ Preller and his staff are very, very, very aggressive in seeking out trades that they feel fit their team. Uh, they're not beholden to timelines like other teams maybe are. So. It doesn't shock me that A.J. Preller and his staff were making calls and maybe making some aggressive moves to try and get players that they view as upgrades for the team. That's just very much – this is known as one of the most aggressive front offices in baseball when it comes to initiating trade talks. So really nothing surprises me about trades that they were maybe talking about. Yeah, A.J. Preller, no question about it. It seems like year in and year out he's been uh, kind of big game hunting. Uh, Kyle, we appreciate it. Baseball back underway. Good win, obviously, last night. Great win for the Padres last night. Thanks for hopping on, as always, here in San Diego. My pleasure, guys. Anytime. All right. Kyle Glazer, formerly Baseball America. Um, I, you know, I thought he sounded slightly encouraged based on the 13 games the Padres have played. You know, he had questions heading into the season like we all did. Um, it sounds like he believes what we believe about the offense, which is it is better than what we saw a year ago. And Kyle's been a guy that every time we've had him on, he's been adamant that this team desperately needs another bat. Mm -hmm. Desperately. So to hear him be complimentary and praise this offense so far this year, I think that's a big thing. Now it's, it's a weird, it's weird because you, you look at the lineup compared to last year's lineup. And I know we do every, we compare everything to last year right now. It's like, wow, this line, this lineup so far this year is better, but last year's lineup, you know, had Juan Soto in it. So that's a weird, it's a weird thing to see just on paper that this year's lineup so far has been significantly better than last year's lineup at this time. But he walked too much. I kid. The, the without truth Fernando is, Tatis Jr. last year, but they have Tatis this year. The so. truth is some of it is like, you know, I'm trying to go like inside baseball with it. Some of it doesn't always make sense. It's like you might have a good dance partner, and you might have a bad dance partner. Right. Individually, yes. the two dancers are good dancers. Like if you guys have good chemistry with each other, it could become Dude. great, but you might not be considered individually like the greatest. That's the thing. I mean, we've seen this, uh, you know, look at the history of baseball. There's some lineups that collectively perform, even though the individual parts aren't the best hitters in the sport. And you can't necessarily explain as to why. I mean, we all understand that. You th- you would think with Soto, Bogart, Tatis, Machado, you fall out of bed top 10 offense in baseball. Oh, yeah, easily. We all thought that. And they weren't. No, so like, close. And they spent the whole offseason, the Padres front office, people that cover the sport, analyzing it and saying the Padres offense is going to be good. And it wasn't. And then there's people saying this year, well, the Padres offense is going to take a step back because they don't have X, Y, or Z. But it's not as simple always as that. And again, we can't make everything out of 13 games either. Mm-hmm. But it isn't as simple as saying... You don't have a really good hitter, therefore your offense automatically is worse. I mean, clearly, because this isn't a one-off game. There have been 10, 12, 14 innings that we didn't even see a year ago, like the first month of the year. Yeah, last night's game, um, I I don't remember every game last year. Seven run inning? But there was, I probably could count on the just one hand, maybe, maybe, maybe Seven with one innings. finger, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like that's how rare it was to see that team last year have any type of scoring outburst like this team has had this year in multiple games already. Yep. And it's a, it's an encouraging sign, but <laughs> you just don't want to follow last night's win and how amazing that was right. with a clunker tonight. 
you you got to parlay last night into at least a series win yep. at minimum. Yep. And hell, who knows? Maybe get a sweep out of this. And then you go into Dodger Stadium this weekend feeling good about yourself. And you know that playing the Dodgers in LA is going to be difficult. And we were all kind of worried after they lost to a three to the Giants that the schedule was going to be so like difficult to start the season that at the end of the first month, we might be looking up and be like, I don't know about this right now. And hopefully last night's game, I'm not saying is a turning point, but it's a turning point put in the back of your pocket type of game. So whenever they are in a situation where they're trailing in a game by more than three or four runs, it's not going to always happen. They're not going to always have these great comebacks. They're not going to always come back from eight down, eight, nothing. There will probably be a game this year where they're trailing eight, nothing and they lose eight to two. Oh, but to put this game in your back pocket and have that confidence as a team, nothing builds confidence like, like last night's win. Like last night's win is the type of thing that teams need. You can have all the outings you want. You can have all the, the, you know, group team dinners and everything. Last night's game is what makes teams better overall. Now you just have to take that like what it was and bottle it up and, and hopefully you don't lose tonight seven to two. <laughs> well, yeah. The thing is, I go back to, you know, you just don't know. In 2021, they beat Scherzer from eight nothing down. In one of the more remarkable games you'd ever seen in your life, a grand slam from a reliever. What did they do the next game? Did anybody know? Well, they tanked the rest of the season. Oh, it was yeah, July right. 6th, and right. they were basically the worst team in baseball true. from the end of July on. So it, it's early, but we don't know. We don't know what it's going to mean. It, it could mean a lot. It might not mean that much, but we're going to find out in the days and we'll weeks see. ahead. All right, on the other side, what did it sound like last night? Not just in San Diego, but in Chicago on the call. What did it sound like in South Korea? When Tatis homered. You're going to hear that on the other side. Plus, the San Diego State basketball players entered the transfer portal. We'll let you know what that means for SDSU in the 4 o'clock hour. Your chance to win tickets to see Neil Young and Crazy Horse. We're with you until 6 p.m. Stay with us on John and Jim.
All right. What did it sound like last night? Not just in San Diego, but in Chicago and also in Korea. Tatis and the Padres win in epic fashion over the Cubs. That's next. All right, this update is brought to you by Taco Bell. Last night, Padres' epic comeback win versus the Cubs. They won 9-8 to eight, thanks to a Fernando Tatis Jr. two-run home run in the bottom of the eighth inning. Next up for the Padres, game two of their series with the Cubbies. Tonight, 7.05 first pitch. Joe Musgrove on the mound for the Padres. Last night, UConn beat Purdue to complete the back-to-back national championships. And Aztecs news, Kay Gallagher, he has entered the transfer portal this upcoming year. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina Chicken menu with a new Cantina Chicken burrito, quesadilla, bowl, and tacos featuring their new slow-roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina Chicken menu today at participating U.S. Taco Bell locations. While supplies last, contact stores for participation, which varies. By the way, take us with you wherever you go on the free iHeartRadio app. Next hour, your chance to win tickets to see Neil Young and Crazy Horse April 25th, Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater, Padres-Cubs game two tonight at 7.05. So what did this sound like last night? You can imagine that Don Orsillo was probably excited that the Padres came back from 8 nothing down. Just a little bit. And then Fernando Tatis Jr. with two outs in the eighth inning would hit a home run to give the Padres their first lead of the game. It was an all-time Don call. It absolutely was. So if you missed this last night, Padres.tv, Don Orsillo on the call. High drive! Deep left field! At the wall! Gone! That was... Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, yeah that's it. Very, Boom. very quick. Wow. So that was... Yeah, that was epic Don. Epic Don. Epic comeback, epic Don. Yes. Believe it or not, the Cubs broadcasters, Book Shambi was on the call, right? Not as enthused with the Cubs uh, blowing an eight-run lead at Petco. This is a team that won six of seven games coming in. They were six and three overall. I mean, they're cruising to a series opening win, right? Not so fast. This is what it sounded like in Chicago last night. Left field, half going back near the wall, and it's gone. 
And Tatis has given the Padres the lead. It's 9-8. I kind of love that call. He's just like, gone, home run. From the, like opponent perspective yeah i respect that call there's there's some announcers in baseball um that are really good when their team is like losing like the calls for the opposing <laughs> team because they're really like sad because it's a just straight to the point they're not gonna sugarcoat it like it's bad and you hear some calls yeah. like high high drive deep left gone like it's i tad. love those type of calls that's ted Every time, you yes, know, a non Aztec team. touchdown, yes. it could be, you know, a one armed juggling catch in the corner of the end zone. Touchdown Trojans. Yes. I respect that because you know you're not thrilled with it as yeah. the home team announcer. It's like, ah, oh, it sucks. Uh, by the way, the Cubs tweeting out things are great. And then their next tweet was we lose 9 8. And then the Padres tweeting out things are great. Things are great tonight. Essentially. Yeah. Um, awesome. And the Cubs use GR8, which is so cringe. Oh, God. Sorry, Brent. You lose way. because of that. Brent turns it off. You turned it off? Well, yeah, they're up eight nothing. nothing. I was like, this game's over, and then I checked the score, and it was eight seven. I was like, like what the maybe hell? Maybe it's happened? over. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's still over. No, I don't know. I, was, I, I wasn't very happy. This is this is pretty much me in my house. <laughs> 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 I wasn't very happy. It's just like last year. You know, we didn't lead the league in blown saves for nothing. <laughs> Okay, well, what did this sound like in Korea? Because I'm sure a lot of South Korea was locked in for this. This is, a, you know, all of a sudden, 8-7 game. Mm -hmm. So what does this sound like? The Korean call of Tatis's go-ahead home run last night. Superstar, <laughs> All right, that call okay. is definitely my favorite call. But when night. the translation is basically Tatis's homer to give the Padres a nine-eight lead, basically from yes. from what I could ascertain from my I heard Tatis Jr. Korean a lot. knowledge. Exactly, that was oh, that was epic. Was that the best of the three? Yes, Don's pretty good. I, but, I'll take Don's, but, but I like Don's. Don's good. is too short. This is the one thing. Well, well that's because who's cut off? Because I gave you the, the short audio. But here's the thing: I've said this a lot with Don Orsillo. Jim's gonna agree. He's a big moment caller. Like he's a big game voice. Yes. Like his voice screams big moment, big game. Yeah. You want it's never too big of a moment. That's why he does like the national broadcast because they realize that Don on a big game. Oh, yeah. He's going to bring it for a big moment. He is a great voice. This for is that. what I've always said about Ted. I think Ted is great with big moments. I think Ted's terrific. Like, He's always he's gonna the car rushed or you know Lamont last year in Houston like he 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 really is able to encapsulate those big moments. I think Don Orsillo is the same way. And you're talking about Fernando Tatis Jr. We talked about this a little bit last night on the wrap up show. There isn't like a swaggier, flashier, arguably better player at his best than Tatis. For him to do it in that moment um, is cool. I mean, listen, Tyler Wade would have been great. Jackson Merrill would have been great. Grant Pauly, who was optioned down. Would have been great, but Fernando, man, there's there's no one like Fernando. No, no, it makes it that much better. Like they, if they if they won last night's game nine to eight, be, like we said, it, it was if it was a, a Jackson Merrill go ahead two run two run home run. Yep, I mean it would have been still awesome, and we would come in today like man, this rookie is is showing things that we never th expected to see out of him. But when it's like your superstar players that are that are the high price players have the big time contracts. Yeah. The, the, the With flare. the Tony Gwynn cleats. Yeah. By the way, those cleats. Pretty cool. Whew, those are probably, I would have to say, my favorite, one of my favorite ones this year that he's had. Like the, like all the, cust year? the custom cleats so far. All year. Wow. Well, he's had like seven different custom cleats. It's not just like a small sample size here. It's kind of a small sample size. Uh, uh, Graham Pauly has been optioned down. Oh, no. So, and what's interesting here is people have speculated, well, you know, you call up a third catcher, which is what they did in Brett Sullivan. They have Higgy. They have Sully. They just added the nickname. Yeah. They have Campy. They have three nicknamed catchers. 
Yeah. But you're not going to, if Campy's not starting, Campy's not DHing, is he with Manny as your DH? You know, I I look at that and, and think because they have three catchers on the roster now, you can have Campy as your DH. If, I think they pinch hit with him. Because how do you how do you sit Manny? Because Manny's the only D. I mean, what you're going to sit Manny as a DH? Well, what happens when he goes back into the field? Right, but he isn't in the field. So what are they going to do like tonight? If Campy wasn't starting tonight, what do they do? Higgy? No, I know. I'm saying who oh, the DH is. Oh, I, I don't know. No, nope. so I'm saying it's not going to be Campy over Manny, is it? No, it's not. Unless they're not going to give Manny a, a rest day from being a DH. Unless that's he, what I'm asking. He's so, so why Sully here? Because one, they're not using Grand Pauly enough, and Grand Pauly yep. needs time, and Agreed. he needs more at bats, and he needs to develop. Two, I think having three catchers on this roster you kind of look at it as it makes sense because Campy's bat is so valuable mm -hmm. and you can pinch hit him in like the sixth inning and not have to make that double switch yep. or the switch yep. because you have an extra catcher. So with that, I think it, it makes sense to have three catchers on this roster because of how good Campy Sano's bat has been this year so far. Completely agree. I'm with you. I, I think if you could DH Campy, like if Manny was in the field, I'm all for DH and Campy. I think best until lineup, Manny is in the field, it's going to be hard to DH Campy. But you're right. Maybe yeah. you pick a spot. You're in a fifth or sixth inning, and you go early with a pinch hit spot. Right. And all of a sudden, it's Luis Camposano. Yeah. And you wouldn't have done that if you didn't have a third catcher. Yeah, you're not pinch hitting early in that game, yep. or early in a game in the sixth inning with your best bat on the bench, which would be Luis Campy Camposano. Well, we're, we're adding another nickname. Now, we're not. are we losing one? And Paulie, no. That's his actual that's his name. name. But Sully's the nickname. Exactly. Sully, Campy, Higgy. Toddy, Bogey, Wadey, Wadey, Crony, Kimmy. Love me some Crones, though. Jack, Jackson Merrill is the only guy that really doesn't have I a, know. like, it's disappointing. Like a, a definitive nickname. Action Jacksons, that's not it, guys. I'm sorry. If you call Nick Ahmed Nicky, do you call Jackson Merrill Jackie? Mm, I'm Probably say not. No, on that one. All right. On the other side, again, next hour, your chance to win Neil Young tickets with Crazy Horse, April 25th, Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater. Up next, the San Diego State player. Jim has been mentioning it in the updates. Entering the transfer portal. What does it mean for San Diego State as the offseason is underway? Stay with us on John and Jim.
All right, it is transfer portal season. We have our first Aztec in the portal. What does it mean for San Diego State men's basketball? That's next. We have your chance to win Neil Young tickets the 4 o'clock hour as well. We're with you until 6 p.m., John and Jim. So the transfer portal is open, Jim, in college basketball. Like this the greatest time of the year for you? No, not really, because I feel like... You're not Mr. Transfer Portal? No, I'm not Mr. Transfer Portal. I think it's benefited San Diego State, so I'm on board with it because of that, but... Every year you have free agency, so you just can't get comfortable. So you mean all of those tweets that you send me about players that ha are on San Diego State's radar in the transfer portal? You're not. No, I like. You don't that. care about the transfer no, I portal. I do, of course, I care. But it's like it's a 365 day a year sport. But let, first of all, two things. I get so many texts from you. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. I could look right now and I could find a text from you of a tweet about some guy in the transfer okay, portal. But that's like my job. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> don't look. I'm I'm looking. Don't because who don't do that. Nope, I'm looking. Continue what you're gonna say. First of all, last night's game, same ratings as last year for UConn San Diego State. Essentially, both were just between 14 and 15 million. Um, and you know, similar game. I think San Diego State put more pressure on UConn last year than Purdue did last night. Who disagrees with that? I mean, the Essex had it down to five with five minutes and 19 seconds to play. Purdue never threatened in the second half. They just didn't threaten in the second half. Anyway, my point is you go from a national championship to the transfer portal is open. Here we go. You sent me this right Let me here. See it. Uh, Florida Atlantic transfer oh, yeah, Nick guard. Boyd. We Nick talked Boyd. about that on air. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to go back like a week for me to do that. Still, it's within a week for you to send me something that's, that's because uh, I love college football and college basketball. I know you do. So anyway, portal's open. You've talked about in your update. Kate Alger was put on scholarship. Okay. He's been here four years. He's a great Great moment. It, I mean, it was really cool when he was put on scholarship. He comes from a great family. Um, you know, Nate Mensa thanked him when he got to the NBA or left last year. I mean, he does a lot of stuff behind the scenes and with the scout team and was on a Final Four team and a Sweet 16 team. But he's entered his name in the portal and he'll likely be elsewhere, right, for next season. So that opens up a scholarship is my point. And we don't know what else opens up. 
truthfully, if everyone that's on scholarship would have returned, plus the incoming freshmen, you don't have open scholarships. But now you've opened up at least a scholarship because Kate Alger has entered the transfer portal. San Diego State clearly is going to have needs. We don't know what's going to happen with Waters, Parrish, Butler, or others. But the portal is open, Jim, from now until the end of April. So we have about three weeks, and uh, we'll see what transpires for the Aztecs. Like, what's your need here? I know we don't know exactly who's staying and who's leaving, but if you look back at last year and you're Brian Dutcher, what are you trying to accomplish between last year and next year? You need more scoring. You need size. And you need depth. You need a lot of pieces, I feel like. <laughs> now, you you have pieces on this roster that you're going to give opportunities to, but you're losing a 21-9 and nine guy. You're losing yeah, a, all an American. All American. You're losing um, so, a guy that turned into a very important player for your team in Jay Powell defensively. We know defense rules the day here. Right. Um, who knows what happens with Micah Parrish? Who knows what happens with Lamont Butler and Reese Waters? You just need a lot, I feel like. And then I'm, I'm not saying that Brian Dutcher can't get that because he absolutely can. It's just about can he accomplish most of that? Because it, it'd be hard to say, I need f- like these five but they needs, and I'm going to get all five of them in the transfer portal. Yeah, like a year ago, okay, you could have argued they needed a shot-blocking five. They just said, you know what, we, we can't get it, so we're just going to go with what we have. And the truth is, Jaden played so many minutes that a shot-blocking five on this team wouldn't have played like they played two years ago on San Diego State, right? Because you had players like Elijah Saunders and Jay Powell. If you had a shot blocking five, where would they have played? Because Jaden Ledee played like 40 minutes and was an All American. So, and by the way, you look at the defensive numbers at the end of the year, and they were almost identical for the Aztecs between this year and last year when they had Nate Mensa. I think they'll have shot blockers. I think they have some young players coming in. We've talked about a little bit. Magoon Guath, who redshirted this year, he's a seven footer. Guath. Miles Heidi is over 6'10. They say still growing, by the way. So I think they're going to have size. Yeah, I guess the big question right now is Butler Parish Waters. Those are the questions. Butler Parish Waters. Does one leave, do two leave, do three leave? Or do all three stay? Correct. Which is also a possibility. Don't know the likelihood of that, but... That's a good point. And I think them not getting a shot blocker this season, in the end, yeah, it might have hurt them defensively. But I think opening up the middle of the floor completely unlocked Jaden Ledee. Sure. Because I think you stick in a guy that's a pure shot blocker who can't stretch the floor, it's going to make the teams, and they actually ended up doing it anyway, but it's going to clog that lane and make it much harder. It would have made it much harder for Jaden to be the player that he was this year. So it's like kind of like a yin and yang. It's like with double edged sword. What are you going to take? You're going to take a guy that you need a shot blocker, but it might not really benefit your best player in Jane Ledee, or are you going to say, Hey, we can with, you know, with, with uh, hold on getting a shot blocker because we know it's going to have Jane Ledee unlocked now with Jane gone. And it's like, okay, now we can start looking at, let's get a shot blocker now. Cause we're not blocking anybody from maybe unlocking on offense. Like they did with Jaden last year. Yeah. What, what I would say is like, let's say you had Nathan Mensa, man, that would, I mean, let's say you had Nathan Mensa for sixth season. But if you run into a historic UConn team, regardless, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's like you got to a Sweet 16. Now, could you have been a different seed and avoided UConn until later? I mean, that, that game way ahead last of night sucked. Sorry. It sucked. wasn't great. I mean, it was like Zach Eady against UConn. It was so boring. It I, wasn't great. I watched most of the first half. I was hoping Eady was going to crush UConn's little coach when they had their little spats. Oh, how about that? Yeah. There was like one. Um, play made by someone not named Zach Eady that was that put back dunk. Everyone else on Purdue just like I know. was afraid to shoot. They took seven threes in the game. Really, the fewest in over three hundred games. That it was just so boring. You knew UConn you knew was, was gonna happen. You knew yeah. UConn was gonna win. Yeah, you did. You knew it. Purdue did not stand a chance. And um, yeah, yeah Purdue it. had a seven four. One of one figure in Zach Eady. It's 37 points. And they weren't in the game in the second half. Wasn't even close. That's amazing. 
it, it was, really is incredible. It was like, okay, is this game going to end anytime soon? It's because I need to watch this 8-0 Padres game, which we did need right. to end up watching because right. of what happened after the national championship. All right, we'll get to the wrap on the other side. We'll give away Neil Young tickets in the 4 o'clock hour as well. That's how we'll kick off hour two of John and Jim. That's next.
All right, this update is brought to you by Taco Bell. Padres had an epic win last night as they were trailing 8 nothing, but they ended up winning that game 9-8 to thanks to a Fernando Tatis Jr. two-run home run in the eighth inning. Game two of that series tonight at Petco Park. 7.05 first pitch because it's a nationally televised game. Joe Musgrove on the mound for the Padres. National championship game last night. UConn once again is the national champions as they beat Purdue handily. And the Aztecs, Cade Alger, he has entered the transfer portal for the Aztecs this upcoming season. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina Chicken menu with a new Cantina Chicken Burrito, Quesadilla Bowl, and Tacos featuring their new slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina Chicken menu today at participating U.S. Taco Bell location while supplies last. Contact store for participation, which varies. All right, San Diego and Southern California, what's going on? This is hour two of John and Jim. We are with you until 6 p.m. We'll have the rapid 4.30. But Scott Miller, New York Times contributor, is going to swing by momentarily. We'll talk about last night's epic win for the Padres. It was epic. It, it was, was epic. Memorable. If you see the graphic that I made for today's uh, John and Jim show, it, it was say epic. It says epic. All right, let's, multiple times. Let's talk to Scott Miller, New York Times contributor, about the Padres' start this year. I mean, the offense has surprised. It really has. I mean, left for dead yesterday, trailing by eight, come all the way back to win nine eight. They've had some big innings, which is something that really plagued them, their lack of big innings, a year ago. So, Scott, welcome back. We appreciate your time here on John and Jim. What do you make of what you've seen so far from the offense, and can you read anything into it off 13 games or not? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to read read things into it, but certainly, um, you know, I mean, last night's game was uh, was one for the books. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, you never know. That's part of the fun to, to me uh, of an early season. You have a game like last night. You don't know. But come September, if this team does what it hopes it can do, um, you know, there, there may be a night or two in September where you look back to last night's game, you say, you know what, that, that, that game against the Cubs where they were down eight, nothing, that was like one of the two or three turning points of the season. I say one of two or three, because I baseball season so long, I never believe there's one turning point in the season, but you know, two, three, four, whatever it is, you know, th th last night could be uh, one of those nights you look back to when we get into the stretch run and the, and the pennant race. Now, no guarantee it will be The Padres job, of course, is to make sure that it, it is, but, um, you know, I mean, there have been some interesting moments. Like you say, the offense is going. I mean, you know, last night was very a very inspirational win. Um, I think what you read into it, and again, it's tough to read too much into it, but I think, uh, you know, like the Cronenworth at bat, you know, the nine pitch at bat, you know, uh, uh, you know, he's coming off a rough year last year. Um, you know, for him to have a key at bat that goes that deep, that many pitches where he's battling, and he gets some success. You know, he ends up on base. They end up winning. That's these homers. Um, that, that stuff, especially early in the season, just, you know, makes players feel good about themselves. And it, it, it raises the level of confidence. And it also, you know, goes a long way toward helping them forget their struggles from last year. So, you know, again, can't read too much into it. But, um, you know, that, that uh, moments like that with Cronenworth, the, the, the at bat that, that uh, you know he battles and battles and battles and has some success. That those that's the kind of moment that I think you at least read into a little bit. Now a month or two from now, maybe things change, or a month from that two or from now, maybe it changed for the better. And it's like, hey, that you know, Cronenworth off to a really hot start. That was part of it. You know, that nine pitch at bat that night against the Cubs. So you know, a lot of little moments go into making a big, uh, a long season and. Padres, you know, not everything's been good, but they certainly, especially as you say, offensively, have, have, have put a lot of those little moments together to make you think, all right, let's see what happens next. You mentioned Jake Cronenworth. He's off to a, a fantastic start this year, especially yep. coming off of his really bad season last year, have signed that contract and then gets injured and 
does not have a good year, but so far it's so good for uh, Jake Cronenworth, but it's not just Jake Cronenworth. That has been a very nice surprise for this team guy like Jackson Merrill, who we all had question yep. marks going yep. into this season, 20 years old. It's only been done two times in baseball history to have a 20 year old starting in center field for a team of the two guys that I mentioned there, uh, Merrill and Cronenworth. Who's the bigger surprise for you? Um, you know, I, I think I'd say Merrill only because of the rookie status and the fact that he was in double A last year and the fact that he had a really good spring. And we've seen a lot of rookie level players over a lot of years with many teams have good springs. And then when they move into the stadium on opening day with the triple deck and the bright lights, all of a sudden the game's different and then maybe they get off to a slow start. And uh, the fact that Jackson Merrill continues to handle everything in front of him, um, you know, I, I'd say that's a bigger surprise. And, and it's not even because of Merrill's, uh, whatever his talent level is, but, you know, we've seen it before with Cronenworth. I mean, yeah, he had a, he had a bad year last year, but, you know, the, the years before that, um, you know, we, I think we know it's in there with Cronenworth. Um, it's just getting past last year, whereas with Merrill and, and other rookies, that we haven't seen that much. You're just, you can't be sure it's in there until they prove it is. And so, you know, Jackson and the Padres both have to be really happy with what he's been doing so far. No doubt about it. Scott Miller's with us right now, John and Jim, San Diego Sports 760. There were some comments maybe within the last two days from Manny Machado about, you know, it's day by day with this elbow. He may not be 100% per the doctors until truly 2025. Um, should there be any concern with Manny Machado here this year or not? Or is he capable of putting up numbers that Padres fans have been accustomed to him putting up? Yeah, I think he's capable of putting up numbers offensively. I mean, yeah, you'd like to see him at third base because he's he's one of the best in the business at third base. And, and you know, with Tyler Wade and company, the Padres have been, you know, handling things. Although, you know, Wade made a couple of errors in San Francisco. And, I mean, there are just very few Manny Machados around. Uh, uh, and so you're going to miss him defensively, no doubt about it, until he's back there. But, you know, I think given what he's done over his career, I, I think that he can still – his numbers are still going to be there. And I also look to, uh, you know, Shohei Otani, uh, which might sound odd to bring up in relation to Manny Machado. Obviously, different players, different pedigrees. But I bring up Otani just because, um, you know, in the years – when he was coming back from his first Tommy John surgery, and he couldn't pitch, he still put up really good offensive numbers. And this year, he's starting to get hot again. You know, he had the three-hit game in Minnesota last night, uh, and obviously he's not pitching this year after a second elbow procedure. So I bring him up just to say, we've seen it with elite-level players like Otani when they can't perform in one aspect of the game, uh, and, and it was an elbow injury, you know, different than Machado, but elbow injury. Um he still put up really good offensive numbers, and I think I think uh, I think Manny will as well, even though given a slow start. And he, yes, he's having a slow start, and he did not have a great year last year. It was a down year for his standards, and for this team to make the postseason this year, they're going to need a lot of things to go right. Their margin for error is very slim, but I think yep. if you view uh, this season and at the end of the year you tell me Manny Machado didn't have a good year, I'd tell you this Padre team to make the postseason. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they the stars have to put up good numbers, no doubt. I mean, um, you know, especially because you know it's an unproven pitching staff so far, and the bullpen stuff a little bit. And they're you know they're they're still trying to figure out roles for guys and, and and smooth some things out elsewhere. But while that is happening elsewhere on your roster and you're figuring things out, you need the Machados and the Tatises and the Bogarts to play like they play every year. And and I think no. Fair, slimmer. Um, it's tough division. Division's gotten better. You know, Padres cut payroll. Division gets better. Arizona's really good. San Francisco's going to be better than they were last year. So, as I say, you know, yeah, I, if 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 Machado and or Tatis and or, or Bogarts uh, have down years, or one or two of them have down years, then that's just going to make it that much more difficult. Scott, final one for me. Did the did the Dylan Cease trade? changed like the calculation for this season as in before the trade were they a realistic playoff contender and after the trade are they now i don't think it i mean i think it helped 
especially after losing Blake Snell last year and especially after cutting payroll, um, their pitching was going to be thinner anyway. Um, and, you know, Musgrove uh, coming off of that shoulder injury, we still don't know completely what to expect from him this year. Um, you know, hopefully for Padre fans, he gets healthy and figures, you know, it, it goes, gets back to being the old Joe. But, you know, coming off injury like that, you never know. And you Darvish is up, you know, getting up in his upper 30s. So realistically, um, you know, the pitching could be down this year. So I think the seeds trade really helped. Um, uh, I think they needed it. But, you know, it, it adds to the depth. It adds to the quality of their front three starters. But I don't think it took them from non-contender to definite contender. I think it, it you know, took them to the, from the periphery of being a contender into a little stronger status where, uh, you know, maybe they, they've got a better chance to contend even for, you know, for a wild card spot than, than they would have without. The new rules were one of Rob Manfred's, you know, biggest things that he has done to change this game and the pitch clock, especially and. You're seeing all these pitchers now getting injured and big time pitchers having, you know, elbow problems and having to get Tommy John surgeries potentially. How much of an issue is this for the game right now, knowing that, you know, maybe some of these rules are hurting these players out there on the mound? I'm going to tell you two things. One, all these pitcher injuries is a huge issue for the game. Huge. Uh, secondly, within that, I'm going to call BS on tying it to the new rules. I don't think the new rules are causing, I mean, maybe a random injury here or there, but mm -hmm. I don't think move, putting in the pitch clock last year and this year has led to this. I mean, two and three years ago before the pitch clock, we were still having a lot of pitchers go down. Um, I believe Bob Nightingale wrote in USA Today, he cited numbers that, Two years ago, the pitcher injuries were worse than they were last year, and that was before the pitch clock. So that's why I say two things. I think, I think the pitch clock has gotten way overplayed in this, but it's ridiculous the way everybody breaks down. Um, I, I agree with Justin Verlander, who called it a pandemic of pitcher injuries, but I think we need a lot more time to break down why the pitchers are getting hurt. And I'll give you a quick couple of, of bullet points that, you know, we, you, that I think people need to dive into. One uh, is the specialization of, of youth athletes. I think growing up when pitchers are 14, 15, 16, and through high school, the travel ball, high school ball, I think kids are throwing way, way too much at a young age. The arm needs time to recover you can't pitch 10 months out of the year so I, I think there's that I think old velocity people are throwing too hard instead of learning how to pitch you know remember in old days you used to you know pitching was adding and subtracting they called it adding you know up to your fastball and then pulling the string a little bit uh, you know not throwing as hard you know you change speed now it's all maximum velocity pitch after pitch I think that injures arms the the as I said pitching too much starting too young injures arms um and i think uh with the analytics movement in baseball you know analytics people identified like 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 john your specialty is the slider so when you go out there we want you to throw that 80 percent of the time don't throw it 20 percent but throw it 80 so now you're overthrowing mm -hmm. one pitch which is really hard on your arms trying to spin the ball all of that like i say it, it can be a three-hour discussion but those points I just brought up, all, I think, have damaged pitchers' arms even before they get drafted professionally. And so many of these guys are, are like time bombs. Their arms are waiting to explode from all the stuff they've done even before they become professionals. And somebody somewhere has got to figure this out because it is just – it's sad and it's too bad everybody has to go through Tommy John before they're 22. Really well said. And by the way, this is a, this is something that's been going on long before the pitch clock. I mean, this is right. this is the era that we're in. I mean, this is kind of that post steroid era. Yeah. Everyone throws hard. Look at the pitching injuries; they're up from from 1995 to today. They're up from 1965 through 1995. I promise you yeah. of that. Um, the only thing yeah. I'd say with the pitch clock is I don't. I think it's gotten way overblown, as I just said. 
the only thing I say that's a horrible look for baseball is when you've got the players union in the commissioner's office arguing, throwing spitballs at each other about this pitch clock. It's like, this is a bad enough, significant enough issue. It would be really good if the players union and commissioner's office could get together, whether it's agree. form a joint study or figure this out rather than sniping at each other. Cause it's to everybody's benefit to get this figured out. hundred percent. Scott, thank you so much. We'll do it again soon. Always appreciate the right. inside. Thanks guys. I, I would say this. I mean, he, he, it's a great point. Like, why would you be arguing over this publicly? It's a, the detriment of the players union and the sport as a whole to be talking about this publicly. And if it's as simple as the clock, I mean, are you telling me if the clock was not 20 seconds, but 24 guys aren't blowing out their UCL? Hey man, an extra few seconds make a difference. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. I, I think it's just, if you compare, you know, how many guys throw triple digits nowadays exactly. to back in the day, you know, not saying that Nolan Ryan won't be as good today, but you know, everyone's got everyone's Nolan, Ryan. Nolan Ryan express these days and everybody can throw triple digits. And that takes a big strain on your arm. Yeah. I just feel like most pitchers nowadays eventually will have Tommy John surgery. Yes. It's almost one of those things where like, let's just get that out of this. Let's just get this out of the way now. I know. You know? It's really weird because then I feel like I come back stronger because you usually see guys that get Tommy John surgery. It feels like they come back stronger, right? I don't know. I need to see the date on it. They, yeah, some guys absolutely throw harder. As in, you had Tommy John surgery? You or me? Like you, Darvish? I have no. I can't even keep track because everyone recovers from it. Yeah, I mean, they right. Nobody's career, by and large, ends as a result of Tommy John, right? Not that I 90% know. Ninety percent plus. It's a. It's, it's more like a shoulder. Shoulder, you're in trouble. Shoulders are problems. Yep. Elbows, you can repair those pretty quickly, and you can even do it two times. Yeah, multiple and times. Back, you know. Yeah, not with the same level of success. Yeah, I mean, again, like Nelson Lamed, who had Tommy John, and that was the end of his career. He never had it though, or he was supposed to get it another time, right? Because he broke down at the end of 2020, and then he was advised to get surgery and didn't. And then he ended up getting it the next year, right? Did he? Because he came back. I don't remember him having surgery. I thought he just tried to recover. I thought he had surgery. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, it's an interesting. I I'm glad you mentioned it because we haven't really talked about it on John and Jim. It's a problem. Yep. And it also speaks to something that Kyle Glazer said earlier, maybe Scott Miller just said there, that you're relying on a rotation that you need. All these teams are. Yeah. All these teams are relying on rotations to stay healthy, mm -hmm. yet you're seeing guys break down at the beginning of a season. And what do you do? If you get an injury, and by you I mean the Padres, yep. from the top of your rotation. Basically top four. Top four. You're in trouble. Yep. Now, I would argue that and while well, Michael King is definitely important, I would argue that Musgrove, Cease, and Agreed. Darvish are more important. Agreed. I agree. Having those three guys intact for the entire year is everything yep. for this team's chances to make the postseason this year. Because if you make the postseason, those are probably the three guys you're rolling out there to start in the wild card round. Yep. That's just what you're doing. And Michael King would be a great addition to the bullpen in the postseason, and depending on how far you would go, I mean, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here, but Michael King wouldn't you be used as a starter really until, you know, in series, which would be a, a, the CS. So potentially, depending on how he's pitching yep. and who however, everyone else is pitching yep. in the rotation, but the top three in the Padres rotation, Cease, Musgrove, Darvish, the, the, they're, they're everything, everything to this team's six uh, chances to make the postseason this year. And I mean, I guess you could say that about a number of other teams. I haven't done the deep dive. But like even watching last night, and you see Darvish ineffective. He had been so effective to start the year. He only pitched. threw sixty something pitches, right? And it's like he just didn't have yeah, it. Yeah. And it's early. And then you know you you think back, you're like you know he, the end of his 2021 season, he was hurt. The end of his 2023 season, he was hurt. He's not getting younger. None of these guys are. And by the way, you can be 2020, you can be 22 and still suffer significant injuries. But you're, it's always in the back of your mind. Hey, he only went this long into an outing. Why? What are the ramifications of him not having a year in which he makes 30 starts for the San Diego Padres? And it's not just Darvish. And it's not just the Padres. It's what all these teams are dealing with. And I, I don't know. Other teams have to overcome it. So I guess if it happened here, they'd have to overcome it as well. Yeah, it's just knock on wood there. Just knock on wood. Yeah, I mean, but the truth is, it's one of those things that like, you know, again, Darvish 2021, he was hurt. Darvish 2023, he was like, nobody has any control over it. Cease, we talked about this, and I said this. Same thing with Clevenger. 
when they traded for Clevenger, I wasn't going to put it on Preller if he got hurt. He got hurt. Yep. I'm not going to put Cease on Preller if he gets hurt. How can you? You can't. All, all these guys are are prone to it. The only the only thing you put on Preller if the guy doesn't really perform. Exactly. Then you're like, okay, that didn't work out. Yeah, I agree with that. But if the guy gets hurt, then yeah, of course you just. Now, if you if you traded for a guy that was damaged goods, then that's yes. a, that's a problem, right? If you sign a guy that's damaged goods, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Xander Bogarts, <clears throat> but let's yeah. hope not. I, I mean, know. it was an issue last year. I know, yep. and he had a home run last night. Yep. But uh, it's this. That's it's a just, bad look. Listen, yeah. if that happened with Bogarts, where the wrist was something that plagued him for a long period of time, mm-hmm. let's just say that's got to be put on Padres medical staff like yeah. it's not like it was something that occurred mm-hmm. last year that data and information was already out there right i don't Heading know Heading into last I, year i thought so i know when they signed bogarts i don't think the first thing i thought of was man that wrist is a little wonky True. i agree we found about i found out about the wrist when this as the season was going on and he was getting cortisone shots and you're like what the f right you weren't looking at the medicals over the offseason like, oh, no there's yeah. a red flag here Yeah, they didn't give me the medicals unfortunately i, I was not privy to those discussions John. okay um we'll do the wrap on the other side explain to me why tonight's game is at 7 5 p.m right now yeah because it's on tbs okay yes national televised game which i said in the update i wasn't listening i know you weren't yeah, no, we can tell but typically they're at 6 40 correct and that means that uh tonight's game will end Way past our bedtimes. This would be an old school start because we yeah. started start at seven. seven Man, I hated. Uh, I know seven ten starts and pre pitch clock. <sighs> oh, I mean, we were going on the air. We late were we lot. were here till like yeah, midnight. we're on the radio a couple. Of, yeah, oh yeah, later sometimes with extra innings. Our that, first year of the wrap up show. No, they had the runner at second in twenty twenty. But we had a twenty twenty game, John. Correct me if I'm Fifteen. It was the Tingler. No, it was 2021. 20, and they went 15. And it was the Tingler, like, kind of. He, like, forgot to double switch or they right. ran out of players. And they kept batting a, a pitcher every inning. That's in, like, before the, the 10th, DH. 12th, and 14th inning. That was the aha. Tingler's not really a good manager. And that's moments. when he lost the clubhouse, clearly. Yeah. And there was no way to recover. We were here till what, one or two in the morning? Yes. It definitely. was a long night. <laughs> it was a long season. <laughs> Let's get this thing rolling tonight, it's guys. A long decade. Let's get a 2 1 victory, okay? <laughs> we'll take it. Any yeah. type of victory. All right. The wrap is on the other side. We'll give away Neil Young tickets this hour as well. Stay with us. All right, imagine waking up this time next week and being 100% debt-free with no credit cards, no car loan, no personal loan. Hey, guys, it's Schaefer. Loan Pronto's Equity Express line of credit can make it happen. Homeowners are turning their home equity into cash almost instantly with Loan Pronto's AI-based system. You can get approval in about 10 minutes with almost no documentation, no appraisal, and no hassle. You could get hundreds of thousands of dollars out of your home. And you can use that money to pay off all your other loans. In fact, the average homeowner saves over $850 a month doing this. That is so much money. Listen, your home value is way up. You can use that to wipe out all those credit cards, get some money for home improvement. Literally hundreds of thousands of dollars are at your fingertips. And approval is just minutes away. Call now. Here's the number. 619-207-4336. Write this down. 619-207-4336. Or loanpronto.com, 619-207-4336, NMLS 1661781, subject to lender approval, equal housing lender.
This update's brought to you by Taco Bell. Padres beat the Cubbies last night, nine to eight, thanks to a seven run sixth inning and then a two run go ahead home run in the eighth inning by Fernando Tatis Jr. Game two of that series, latest night at Petco Park, 705 first pitch because it's a nationally televised game. Joe Musgrove on the mound making the start for the Padres on his two, sorry, three year anniversary of his no hitter in Texas. Last night, the national championship game in Arizona was boring. Uh, UConn, they beat Purdue to go back to back and win their second straight national championship. And Aztecs news, Aztec forward Cade Alger, he has entered the transfer portal. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina chicken menu with a new Cantina chicken burrito, quesadilla bowl, and tacos featuring their new slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina chicken menu today at a participating U.S. Taco Bell location while supplies last. Contact store for participation, which varies. By the way, Radio app. Anytime you're listening to John and Jim, you can take us with you. Use the free iHeartRadio app. Are you reading anything into this before we get to the wrap? We've mentioned this before. BetOnline.ag. LeBron James Jr. odds. Bronny James. Is his name LeBron James? Yes. Actually, it is. Okay, but Bronny. Yes. yes. Um, Bronny landing spots in the portal. The sixth shortest odds. I read nothing into this. Nothing. Nothing. Do no. you? San Diego State. We've no. talked about this. I mean, again, I, I'm not... It's a credit to San Diego State. They have those odds. I know, but no, right? No. The best odds are Duquesne. The second best odds are Ohio State. Well, Duquesne is where his where his buddy, where, his, where LeBron's best friend... Like, yeah, like a went former to. coach of his in high school or something? Former friend of his in high okay, school. Okay, is that what it was? was on the basketball okay. team with him. Like the... One of those players that was on the team with him in high school. Yeah. I don't say Vincent, Saint Saint Vincent Mary. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, he has that preseason workout at the jam center every year. So obviously. Right. Okay. Oh, oh. See, that's the connection. And guys. the Lakers are in Southern California. And so are the Aztecs. Uh, oh, Duquesne's not in Southern California. Uh, it's in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's it's there's Ohio state. Uh, uh. Ohio state is not in Southern California anymore. You're right. Could you imagine? What? If, what? Uh, they, if they got brawny San Diego State, yeah, <laughs> it would be. the um. <laughs> so again, I don't, I don't look into any of this stuff. The stuff you see, at like BetOnline.ag, I don't know. I feel like it's for clicks or chatter or conversation. To, I don't think it has. There has to be some that. type of. I think it's the knowledge. Southern California play. It probably is, but usually, when the odds go up, there is somebody with some type of information to make those odds the way they are. <laughs> you know, since we're talking about random transfer portal guys, uh, what do you think the odds of? Do you think they'll go after a what do they call that guy, Cream Abdul Jabbar? Oh the yes, Indiana State guy? no, he's he's on the no contact in the portal, oh. and his coach left Indiana State for St. Louis, which means people are ticketing him for St. Louis. Oh, the Billikens. Okay. What is no contact? No mean? contact means you may already have your mind made up. You, if you're a star, let's use Jim as an example because you played a very high level of middle school basketball. Very high level Jim of middle Rats. school and high school. Yes. Okay, so let's say you go in the portal. Seriously, in high school, I go in the portal. No, seriously. Let's say you played. Um, you played Jim last Rats. year at <laughs> Seattle University, and yet next year, fifteen points, five assists per game. Right, like Seattle University High School. No, it's where Darian Tramel played. Let's just pretend. Okay, actually, you made it. In you college. had it, so you had a nice year, and you're a freshman eligibility, and now you're in the portal. Let's say you know that your family lives in San Diego, and you can get a scholarship to San Diego State, and you want to go there. You put do not contact. You don't want to hear from UCLA and USC. So other schools you, don't waste their time. Exactly, on you. and uh, you don't get inundated with all these stupid coaches. You're like I already know where I'm going. I just entered the portal because I have to. Yep. To land somewhere else. So yes, this. Whatever his actual name is, like I don't even. Cream Abdul Jabbar, like yeah. Bobby Avia, or something. Yeah, like that. they say he's gonna end up at St. Louis. Okay. All right. Anyway, let's get to this. Well, Fernando finished in the top three in National League MVP voting this season. I'm gonna say yes. All of our predictions this year had at least Fernando Tatis Jr. doing something. Uh, amazing. So yeah, I'm going to say he's going to finish top three. I think he's going to have a big, big year. We all said it to start the season. Um, and he's already, you know, 
doing things that you're say, okay, that, that's what MVPs do. I agree. I think he'll finish top three. No one's guaranteeing he's going to win it, but I think he hits 40 home runs. I think he has a 950 OPS. I think he has 40 home runs. I think, he, I mean, his career numbers are basically that. Right. So I think he's capable of doing it. Next question. Where will UConn's run in the last two years go down in college basketball history? Well, considering the fact that they trailed in like only two games and both of them were in San Diego playing against San Diego State, right? It's really against Alabama. But it was, but it, but you know what you get what I'm saying. They they won every single game in the last two years in the tournament by double digits. Yep. This this run they had the last two years is is gonna go down as uh, an historic run. I don't know where it ranks, but it, it's pretty high up there. When you win back to back national championships and you essentially don't trail for more than four and a half minutes of any game you play. It's crazy. And you kind of blow everybody out. Like that's a pretty historic run. I think it's more impressive than the last time we saw a back-to-back -back champion. Oh, with all due respect to the Florida Gators under Billy Donovan, they returned right. all their top seven scores return. You guys didn't two players draft in the top 40. Yeah. And that does not include Adama Sonogo, right? Two players draft in the top 40, no Sonogo. Now in the portal, you could replace, but to replace cohesively and win at this level, I think it's the best two-time champs or back-to-back -back champs since at least Duke. I think Duke had it with Grant Hill. Yeah, and yeah. maybe going back to like the old days, like UCLA wooden days. But I think clearly in the last 25 or 30 years, this is the most dominant run. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Florida, only, only they, the they eighth just, school to repeat. Yeah, you mentioned Florida, but like... Yeah, Can you, you do you think really... do you think dominant runs? They had a really good team though. They did. They had a good team. Joachim Noah yeah. and other guys. Like, well, Mike well, Miller. Yeah, Wolford, yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. Not the one that we always call on accident. By the way, they went 68 and 11 those two years, Florida. UConn 68 and 11 the last two years. Next question. That's good. Was this year's UConn team one of the best teams in college basketball history? Oh, this is the same question. Kind of, yeah. Uh, I would say that, hold on, the people taking oh, pictures. people are taking photos yes. of us. It's uh, like we're kind of like, it's, you ever bowl. wonder what it's like to be a panda? They were a fishbowl. This is what it's like. Yes. Do you want some bamboo? Kind of. I love pandas. Um, is this one of the best teams in college basketball history? I say yes. Yes. I don't know. I'm not saying the best, but it's one of the best. One of the best. It's a top 10 team probably maybe, ever. The, maybe the question should be, which UConn team was better, last Ooh, year's team or this year's I team? think this year's. They're the I, worst back-to-back -back champion I mean, ever. I, I'm no scout, but I saw them both up close and personal, and there's this team was incredible. Yeah, they were doing I mean, this team was like, Whoa. unbelievable. But last year's team had some really good players they on did. it. They did. They were both really good. Hawk, I mean, is Hawkins... If you put Hawkins on this team this year, is Jordan Hawkins, he's one of the best players on the team, or is he the best player on the team? Uh... Maybe Newton's phenomenal. Cam Spencer, the transfer from Rutgers, shot 45% from beyond the arc. What about Sonogo? Sonogo is great, but Klingon's pretty darn good, too. It's just this whole, <laughs> whole teams are really yeah. freaking good. Next question. Who do you guys put $5 on Tiger Woods to win the Masters this weekend at 150 to 1 odds? Which is what it is or was. Absolutely. Five bucks? Yeah, why not? Are you kidding me? Entertainment value? Hell yeah. Five pays seven fifty in that Hell scenario. Yeah. I feel like it should pay more than that, don't you? Yeah. There should be also a line for Tiger making the cut. There definitely is. Okay. There definitely I don't know what the number is, but there definitely is. Yep. Well, maybe we'll we'll find out if yeah. no sex is really gonna affect his game this weekend or if it actually is gonna help his game this weekend. So he has said that. Yeah. He said well, part of his training for the masters <laughs> is cutting out sex been watching too many rocky movies he told the media that yes wow uh tiger woods to make the cut will tiger woods make the cut of the 2024 masters this is up at circa right now plus 125 you lay down ten dollars to win 1250 hell yes so 10 bucks for 1250 for woods to make the cut do you feel half decent i mean obviously he's been amazing in augusta but he hasn't played any golf really i haven't seen him this this did he play one this time year? this year no He's not played one time. That is so weird. Um, he he is a guy that is only going to be playing in like the big tournaments. He'll yeah, play in his, a year. He'll play in the Masters every year, or at least attempt to play in the Masters. Uh, he'll play in I oh, I forget what tournament's his, but he tries to play is in it that Riviera. Tournament. I think it might be. Yeah, he plays with his son for those types of like um, uh, tournaments, but now, they're what's not his son now. 
I think his son's his son's in high school. I know that. Yeah. I don't know exactly. So he's still a few years off. Yeah, from I like think he might like, either be a freshman or a sophomore. Okay, he's a few years off from any chance of like professional golf. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I don't know how good he's going to be. He yeah. has all the mannerisms of, of Tiger. That's amazing. But I don't know like exactly if he's gonna how good he can be or will be or is. I mean, he is obviously a really good freaking golfer. Will it be better than Tiger Woods? He's 15. I'm going to say no. He's it's only 15. So 15? Wow. Yeah. Okay, so he's, he's a freshman. Away. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be better than Tiger. I don't think he's going to go and win um, 17 or 16 majors. <laughs> probably not. No. But I'm excited. Masters this weekend. So um, that's two days away, yeah. Yeah, even though I probably won't be watching much of it because it's Aaron's birthday weekend. So you don't think she's gonna want to spend it at home watching the Masters? Yeah, well, I mean, what does no. that mean? You can watch the Masters. Well, I can, but I can't just plop my ass down on my couch for four hours and be like, "All right, babe, uh, I'm gonna watch the Masters." Now. Are you sure it's her birthday weekend? I feel like she, you guys, always are doing something. Yeah, because we like have lives. Uh, you have lives. Aren't you doing things every weekend? I mean, did you? Just I don't have know. A... If people have birthdays every year, like you do. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm kidding. We're actually. Her birthday is on next Monday. Oh, that's not over the weekend. But we're doing things over the weekend. Okay. We're going to a restaurant in Carlsbad. Not during the Masters, you're not. Sunday night. So. Right. But during It'll the day, like she'll be like, let's go to the pier. Let's go to the beach. Let's go walk Bentley. I'm like, okay. All right, you're done with sports. That's fine. All right. On the other I'm side, never you're never again, watching sports again. Yeah. Call right now if you want two free tickets to see Neil Young and Crazy Horse April 25th in less than three weeks at the Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater. This is a great giveaway. The number to call is 877-767-4760. First two callers will be contestants for trivia today. This is for two free tickets to see Neil Young. Here's the number to call. You need to do it right now. 877 877- 767-4760. Again, call right now if you want two free tickets to see Neil Young. We'll play some trivia on the other side. We call it Train Wreck Radio. One more time, 877-767-4760. Call now. That's next. If you're looking for a game changer with your diet, look no further than Almond RX packs. You're going to eliminate the vending machine from your day like I have. You're going to love them. Your family's going to love them. Your kids are going to love them. Almond RX, a daily dose of immunity and vitamin D, a healthy snack for you and your entire family that curbs hunger and is tasty and healthy. It's the first and only skinless almond fortified with vitamin D. It's an immunity booster that was founded by a San Diego sports medicine physician. Almond RX is packed with nutrients. I'm talking about nutrients that benefit your heart health, cellular health, and gut health. And you can find them right here in San Diego. Any food land in San Diego County has Almond RX. Harvest Ranch up in Encinitas, North County, and at almondrx.com. That's A L M O N D R X.com. Go there right now. You're getting free shipping on all orders of $25 or more. You heard me right. If you go there right now, almondrx.com, you're getting free shipping on all orders of $25 or more. Eliminate the vending machine. Eat healthier. Perfect for the -the on-the-go lifestyle. Almond RX.
All right, John and Jim back with you. With you until 6 o'clock here tonight. Padres Cubs game two tonight at 7.05. Yeah, I don't like the start time, John. A little late. Yeah, I don't like the start time. Just uh, because they're uh, moving it? Uh, yeah. Or you say if, if it ain't broke? Well, I'm just afraid about the ending of this game tonight, which will be probably around 10.15-ish. And then we have to go on? Yes. <laughs> okay, a couple of things. You're how old are you? You're like 19. I'm like 35. Okay, you're 35. You sit in your living room like I do, essentially. You're in a room at home. Mm -hmm. You turn the camera on, you put, turn the mic on, and you talk. Yeah. You wouldn't be sleeping otherwise. I text you all the time. You've never been sleeping at 10.15 ever. It's not about me, John. It's about her. Is she get oh okay interesting and we'll get to trade back right <laughs> in a moment. It, are we at the point where Aaron no, despises no, no. the wrap up show? No. We're, Does she not like the wrap up no, show? No, but I she no, she's great. She doesn't, she's like she knows, she understands. I personally am I feel like bad. Some, some, I feel bad. I'm like it's only 162 games. I'm like this is a we're we're doing a lot here. <laughs> and trying to get ready for a wedding and i'm like okay i'm gonna go off and watch sports and do the wrap-up show and she this is paying for the elegant wedding with the beef uh, you know filet we're not getting filet that was too much money. i'm kidding it's not we're doing it because it's we, we, basically it's like you gotta do it i know all right i'll see you tonight whenever it ends yeah, i'll see you tonight too all right let's play <laughs> in a moment All right, three questions, two contestants, one lifeline. Today's contestants, we have Dave and we have Terry. Dave, you called in first. So you have your choice of John or Jim. Who do you want to go with? I'll take Jim. Oh, oh wow. Okay, I so like that. Dave and Jim? Dave and Jim and Terry and John. Terry, you good with that? I'm good with that. Perfect. Okay, I'm good with it too, Terry. Yes, everyone's good with their partners. Brent, what is the question of the day? <laughs> All right, guys, the Padres are currently 10th in baseball with a 752 OPS. Today's question, can you name the nine teams with a better OPS than the Padres this season? Ooh. All right, on base plus slugging, the best offensive teams in baseball so far. Terry, you're up first. What is your first guess? You do have your lifeline, which is John, if you want to use it. I'm going to go with Cubs. The Cubs. Chicago Cubs, top nine. Yeah, they've been really, really good. They've gotten off to a good start. Shoot, really yesterday scored eight runs. That's a lot. Yeah. A lot of runs. A lot of runs. Dave, you're up next. What is your first guess? You do have a lifeline if you choose to use it. I'm going to go with the Dodgers. The Dodgers. LA Dodgers, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. on the list. Yeah. Terry, you're up next. What's your second guess? You do have a lifeline if you want to use it. Yankees. The Yankees. New York Yankees. No! no! Outside the top 10. Wow. Okay. Bad trade. Soto sucks. Yeah. Dave, you're up next. What is your second guess? You do have a lifeline if you want to use it. I'm going to go uh, with a lifeline. This okay. One. okay. That's me? No, that's me, John. Oh, good. This is Dave. He's my partner. Jim. I'd say the A's. Yes. <laughs> all right jim all right here we go Ready? i'm jim did you take the ace no 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 stop it <laughs> i'm gonna go with oh man it's so tough the the uh i'll go with the texas rangers do you take that texas rangers yes i will texas rangers <laughs> oh my god Wait, it was right. I had the button on the wrong. That was kind of interesting. Okay, it was scary. I'm an idiot. No, I'm smart. Okay, that was right. All right, let's go. All right, look at Jim. All right, Terry, you're gonna need this thing to stay in the game. What is your final guess? You do have your lifeline, which is John. If you want to use it, John looks like he has no idea. No, I have some. Oh, he has an idea. He's gonna tell. He's gonna tell you the A's. What do you got, Terry? Life, lifeline, lifeline. All right, I really like the way the Marlins have played. I'm kidding. Um, I'll give you Atlanta. Crap. In fact, I'll I'll guarantee Atlanta's on the list. Oh crap! You take that, Terry. Yep. I don't guarantee a lot, but I know Atlanta's on the list. Okay, Dave, you're up next to win the game. What do you got? You don't have a lifeline either. All right, I'm going to go with the, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Pittsburgh off to a good, good start. Guess. And on that the is list. such a good guess. Is that it? That's it. That is such a good guess. 
Terry got one wrong. Terry got one wrong. Which one? The second one, whatever that was. Right. Text. No. Forget what he got wrong. He said the Yankees. Oh, Yankees. Yankees Soto. Yeah. Socks. Yeah. <laughs> Glad somebody's paying attention. All right. Who's Thank on you. this list? Uh, teams in the top 10 in OPS this year, other than the Padres. All right. Braves are number one. Doyers are two. The Brewers are three. Cubs are four. Rangers are five. Pirates are six. The Reds are seven. Arizona is eight. And then Houston is nine. The Yankees are 11th. So, oh, you're oh man, they're horrible. That team is awful. Okay. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. So congratulations, by the way, to, I'm going to say Dave, for winning two tickets. See Neil Young and Crazy Horse. This is April 25th. Cal Coast Credit Union Amphitheater, 16 days away. Should be pretty cool to see Neil Young here in San Diego. Ticketmaster.com for tickets and info. If you didn't win today, another chance to win tomorrow right here at John and Jim Trainwreck Radio at the same time. We have something that has happened for the first time ever on television related to sports that we will share on the other side. Plus, is last night the start of something or not for the Padres? As we get ready for game two of this three-game series, we'll kick off hour three of John and Jim. We have Jim's back page still ahead. Everyone's excited for that. Hour three of John and Jim. That'll start next. Stay with us.
All right, this update is brought to you by Taco Bell. Padres Cubs game two of their three game series tonight at Petco Park. 705 first pitch because this game is a nationally televised game. Joe Musgrove on the mound for the Padres. It's a three year anniversary of his no hitter in Texas. Moving over to college basketball last night, the national championship game. UConn beat Purdue to complete their back to back national titles. And Aztecs news of the day, Kate Alger, he has entered the transfer portal. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina Chicken menu with a new Cantina Chicken Burrito, Quesadilla Bowl, and Tacos featuring their slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina Chicken menu today at a participating U.S. Taco Bell location. While supplies last, contact store for participation, which varies. All right, San Diego and Southern California, what's going on? Final hour of John and Jim with you until 6 p.m. We continue to react to last night for the Padres and look ahead to tonight, game two of that series. Plus, we have something that has happened in the NCAA tournament for the first time ever. The ratings are out, and it is officially official. Mm -hmm. The women's game did top the men's game. By in a, a title game. It wasn't even close. By a large margin. <laughs> Huge margin. I think somewhere, something like $5 million. Um, It's the first time ever that the women's title game has topped the men's title game. Mm -hmm. I mean, going back since this game's been on TV, I guess. So is that a one-off or the sign of something that's to come? Obviously, Caitlin Clark will no longer be in college basketball, but players like Juju Watkins and, I mean, we saw Angel Reese. She's announced she's going pro as well. But there's been some stars that have come to be over the last couple of years in college. I don't know if it's going to get that high again just because I think Caitlin Clark was the one player that transcended. She definitely did. Um, and it's good for college women's basketball. Now it, it's up to whoever's behind Caitlin Clark in, in college women's basketball to take that torch and make something of it, right? I don't know if you're going to get that next year or not, but I mean, focusing on just this year and what this year's women's basketball players did, especially Caitlin Clark, compared to the men's side, I think the women's game has not only more players that people like can attach to, but you're seeing in the men's game, the transfer portal is just making it so hard for people to be attached to certain men's basketball players at schools for longer than one year. That definitely could be playing a role. I mean, here's something that's really fascinating. The most rated men's game of the tournament wasn't even in the Final Four. It was Duke-NC State Elite Eight, 15.1 million. The national championship was under 15 million. But listen to this. Last year's San Diego State-UConn game was 48% higher ratings than the women's title game, which had Caitlin Clark in it, Iowa and LSU. This year's men's game trailed the women's game by 21%. It went from... Trailing by 48% the women's game last year to exceeding the men's game by 21% the next year. Do you think a part of that also has to do with everyone kind of just was like, oh, UConn's going to win, so I'd have to watch? Maybe. I'm trying to equate that to a dominant team in professional sports recently. Like, were there Warriors teams like, eh, they're just going to win, therefore we're not going to watch? Or, or, you know, Patriots are so good. That's different Super Bowl. Um, or like a World Series winning team, they're so good that it doesn't bring you to the television. Um, you know what I mean? Like, is there something like this team is so good? I'm not going to watch. I don't know. I know when the Warriors won the their... 73 win season. No, no, no. The um... oh, they lost that year. Yeah, it may... the uh, second year of KD when they went back to back. Yep. Versus LeBron, and they swept them in the finals. Yeah. I would say of the like the run that the Warriors and Cavs had together, right? Mm -hmm. I would. I, was just, I don't know for a fact, but I would just say that's the lowest rated of the times they face each other in the finals, just because makes sense. You have a dominant team. The Cavs were kind of reeling. All they had was LeBron. After Game One, even though LeBron had fifty in Game One that year, you knew it was over because they lost. They lost, yeah. and then it was like, okay, here's the sweep. Was that the game? I'm I'm gonna forget what I'm gonna say, 
But like something happened. J.R. Late- Smith. J.R. Smith. Yeah. What happened again? I forgot. Uh, rebound <laughs> by J.R. Smith. Just a couple seconds left on the clock. And instead of putting the ball back up, he dribbled it out. They could have won. To, yes. Oh, they, they, that was a disaster. And he dribbled the ball out. And LeBron's looking at him like, what are you doing? Yeah, Shoot the ball. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I think college basketball pushed Caitlin Clark more this year. I Maybe. think that adds to the, you know, jumping ratings from last year's title game. Because, you know, everywhere you looked, you know, whether it was commercials or just them just promoting them in Iowa on social media, you know, she was everywhere, you know, she was around, you know, last year too, but not like this year, like this year it went from, you know, she was on like Peyton Manning levels of like every other commercial and stuff like that to where she was a lot more in the public eye this year. So I, and lots of people that were casual sports fans last year that might not have paid any attention. They just jumped on the bandwagon this year. I, I said it yesterday. Just my question is, is it like a tiger woods effect that, there have been a lot of brilliant golfers. The guys in the PGA Tour, I bet they're sensational and terrific. And there's guys that have multiple majors that are playing right now, maybe three, four, five. But they just don't resonate like Tiger. I mean, that's a simple fact. Mm-hmm. And you can have Brooks Kepka and whomever else. Rory, Scotty and, Scheffler. Yeah, and there have been some amazing offers. But yeah. they're just not going to ever reach that threshold, therefore that viewership, therefore that interest. Is that Caitlin Clark? Is she... Yes generational yes yeah, it, it's easy to say it now i'm just wondering like is there an x well it's gonna take somebody in the women's game in the future to play like her play like her yeah. and get close to her records because if you have another yeah. player out there that gets close to her records and their team is good and their team makes deep runs in the NCAA that'll tournament get to their television that'll get people to the tournament like hey this this you know girl on yep whatever team Bro, Ohio state yeah is about to break caitlin clark's all-time record for three pointers made or whatever the case no, may you're be. right and they're in the final four and it's also a good thing that espn and like brent said national commercials push the women's game and that also helps as well you can't tell me that doesn't help that definitely helps i agree because i see caitlin clark on the state farm commercials all the time now yeah i see caitlin clark all over espn i hear people talking about caitlin clark all the time and that's a good thing for that sport and it's a good thing for any sport Because all you want is to be promoted. You can't do it just on your own. You need help. Everybody does. Men's game, women's game, and like every sport needs help. You can't just roll the ball out there in any sport and expect people to watch it without quality, proper promotion. The San Diego Padres have been very well marketed here locally, at least. Yes. Uh, Mike Schilt has spoke with the media within the last few minutes. Schilty has spoken on Graham Pauly. So the big move today, again, Padres have this Unbelievable comeback yesterday, capped off by Tatis's two out two run homer in the eighth. They come all the way back from eight nothing down to win nine eight, and then they make a move. Graham Pauly, who's a promising young prospect but wasn't playing, has been optioned to AAA. Brett Sullivan, veteran catcher, comes up. They now have three catchers, maybe gives them some flexibility with Luis Campusano when he doesn't start behind the plate. Mike Schilt on sending Pauly to El Paso. Thank you, producer, on a trip. Hmm. Um, Mike Schultz says this. Schulte says, just going and playing, going and getting consistent ABs, talking about why he's going to AAA. And then he said this. He did a great job when he was here. Now he's got that experience to grow from. Well, yeah. So he said basically nothing. But Grand Pauly needs it bath is what everyone is saying. I, yeah, we, we said that. Yes, we have. We said that. Yeah. I think three catchers. Um you can make it make sense and it makes it it does make sense with the way that this bench is constructed with the way that this lineup is with the with the bat of Luis Campisano being so important to this team how it, you need to have it be ready at any moment if he's on the bench instead of well we can't use Campisano today in the 6th or 7th inning because right. we told him you get a day off from catching right um so Brett Sullivan there makes Makes sense. It just makes sense. And Grand Pauly, would you have liked to see him play more at third base? Yeah. Would you like to see him obviously have more success? Yes. That's just the, what happens with a young player that is kind of a fringe guy. Like he's not going to be playing every day. And that makes it very tough. Like I think one of the reasons why Jackson Merrill is having success early on is he's playing. He's playing every day. He's getting in the back. That makes a difference out there every day when you have a routine every day. You don't have to worry about, am I going to be in the lineup today or am I not going to be in the lineup today? It makes a difference. Oh, a huge difference. I mean, okay, For by the way, does anyone know what Brett Sullivan was hitting in AAA? It's 
this? Uh, I'm going to say 412. All right. You know what Brett Sullivan was hitting in AAA? 11 games. Oh, he doesn't know. He's doing something. He hit 472 good? in 11 games. Now, my guess is he might not hit 472 here, but he was really hitting it well. Maybe that played a role as well. I think this is more about Paulie than it is about Sullivan. And we talked to that effect uh, with Kyle Glazer earlier today. I think Sullivan gives them flexibility, which is nice, mm -hmm. but I think Paulie's got to play. This is less about Sullivan's 472 start and more about Paulie having 15 ABs in 13 games. You can't have one at bat per game mm -hmm. as a youngster and expect that player to produce. The only thing, though, is if Grand Pauly breaks down in the minors, okay. which you hope he does, and then they decide to bring him back up during this season, you would want him to play, though. You don't want to just stick him on the bench. Oh, when he comes up? Assuming he comes back up, he's got to play. Yes. Yeah, unless it's September and your minor league season's over and then you just figure it out. Or the major league season's over. True. <laughs> you know no, I mean? if the, Well, if the major league season's over, he's going to play. Mm -hmm. If the minor league season's over, he might get an opportunity. But you're right. The next time he's up, he, he needs an opportunity to play close to every day. I wonder if it's going to be a situation. If, we'll see if you guys remember this. You remember uh, Luis Urias when he was up here? Sure. Yeah. He couldn't hit when he was on the big club. But when they, they sent him down, a. he would hit 750 and because he was too good to be down in the minors, but he wasn't good enough to be up here. Quad he, A player. Yes. He was like in this weird limbo. Maybe when he was here. Yeah. Does it feel like that could be a risk there? Because we don't want to send him down because he's not going to get any better just going down there raking off of a ball guys. But, you know, sitting up here, he's not getting enough reps. No, you got to play. I mean, I understand what you're saying. You can't read too much into the numbers down there. Like Brett Sullivan's hitting 472. A 30 year old journeyman catcher is hitting 472. Yeah, I just remember we'd always send Urias down because he was hitting 220 and then he'd go down in the minors hit and hit like 90. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say, oh, a guy needs seasoning, I are you going to get the proper seasoning at the minor league level? Or are you going to get that? Or, or the only here? Or the only way to be to like fully get that development and go through the ups and downs and see like the pitching that you need to succeed against. It's going to have to happen at the major league level. Cause yeah, the guy, you got to play. I know you got to play, but are you really, it's like a chicken and egg thing. Yeah, it is like you can go down to the minors hit four twelve, but, right, but be a like, 200 hitter at the big leagues. Yeah, definitely. Like, Oh, but he's developing at the minor league level. Well, if he's developing, he should be doing better at the big league level. So well, you, jury's out. Well, because yeah, he's only had the limited. How many bats does he have? Fifteen. Okay, it's nothing. That's the thing. So he hasn't had the opportunity. I guess the question is: next time he produces in the minor leagues, will they give him a more of an opportunity? And if they do give him more of an opportunity, will he produce at the major league level? But that's not that's not really the story. I mean, it's a story to come out of what happened yesterday, which is the Padres from out of nowhere came back from eight nothing down. I mean, imagine the like tenor. an RKO. A what? He doesn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Nothing. He said out of nowhere, and I said like an RKO. Like the people's elbow. Close. But hear me out. Imagine if the Padres lost yesterday, which, by the way, 99.5% of the time they're going to lose, trailing 8 nothing, right? So let's just say they lost the game 8-3. Okay, you know, a couple home runs, whatever. They lose 8-3. They're now, uh, what's the record? They're 5-8. and eight. Yes. Okay, so in this alternate world where the Cubs take an 8 nothing lead and hold it, and the Padres are now 5-8, and eight, what are we saying today? Offense sucks. You're saying a lot of different things. Yes. O over one game, are we not? Does one inning just completely change everything? That's the question. Or is it one of those things where you, you know, it's like a feast or famine argument? Do you want to see a team that scores multiple runs for multiple innings or, or this like, well, at any moment they can score seven runs in an inning type of team? I mean, I'll take the seven runs and I any would moment. too, but I've also... had a lot of, Four or five run innings. Yeah, but I also would love a team that puts pressure on multiple innings, can score multiple runs in multiple innings. And if you look up and you have, you know, a run inning, a four run inning, a two run inning, or one run, like that, like if you score seven runs over three innings, is that more impactful to a game? Now we're getting into I know. complete hypotheticals. Here's the, the question for me is this. Is what happened last night more than a game? Is it going to be <laughs> something they 
use as a spring, yeah. springboard. And nobody, to your point, nobody's talking about turning points, but like, what is the value of overcoming an eight-run deficit? It's not the first time they've ever done it. They did it in 2021, and they weren't this amazing team despite the fact that they did it. Is this going to be different in 2024 now that they've done it? I'm with you. I think it's the ultimate confidence booster, especially when you do it early. Let's start uh, small here, and let's just say, will it be a difference just in this series? Can they, can uh, they, it's a great question. Can they win this series in hell? Can they maybe even sweep this series? Because if they end up losing these next two games of the Cubs, <laughs> right, then it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Right. In, in a way, they could use it as a springboard because we've talked about this before where they were similar to last year to where, you know, last year, if they went down three nothing, it was like, it's over. There's, you know, we can't come back from three runs down to where now they've shown that they came back from eight. And granted, it's probably, you know, a one off and a, fluke they're not going to you know do it multiple times coming back from eight runs but now they know in their heads that they can do it to where if they fall True. behind three four runs early in the game that it's not going to be them just kind of moping around in the dugout like they used to just like oh well it's over just gotta move on to the next one to where now you know they have a little confidence so that they can come back i also would say this and not that anyone's serious about this even though i saw it all over social media like you're not a real fan if Oh god. Guys, it's a 162 game season. You've watched baseball your whole life. Teams that trail ain't nothing lose. <laughs> it doesn't mean the game's over. We've seen examples of teams overcoming eight run deficits yeah. like yesterday with the Padres. But if you happen to turn on the national championship, if you happen to step away, if you happen to be critical, then you happen to be a human being. Mm -hmm. Because human beings can't occupy three hours 162 times mm -hmm. and just say nothing else matters. I have to sit here for three hours, even with my team. Trailing by eight runs. This game was over yesterday. <laughs> it appeared to be or felt. This one was over. They put together really good at bats. That's a credit to them. That's credit to the players. Mm -hmm. That's that last night was a players. Like all, that's all on the players. Credit to them. And it starts with the at bats in that sixth inning. This team could have easily just said, let's just play this one out. Maybe we get a couple runs here and there, but it, it ain't nothing. This one's over. And I bet you some of those players in that dugout thought that because um, some of them weren't even uh, playing yesterday. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. So you can't tell me that all 26 guys in that dugout believed after they went down 8 nothing. Like, we we got can win one. it. Right. We got it, guys. Like, no, it, this is like everyone's a human. Everyone has, you know, everyone lives in the same, same universe and reality. It's not just always a, we can overcome anything, guys. Not Anakin. Well, was I right? Uh, you tried. You tried to. You <laughs> it's tried. a different world, galaxy far away. Well, so, uh, considering the fact that when he tried to overcome the dark side, he didn't, and then he tried to overcome his son, and he didn't, and he died. So you're saying himself. that the Padres' Sorry, yeah. comeback was better than anything Anakin accomplished in any of those shows? Well, Anakin did save the universe, kind of a different universe, though. True, because he actually fulfilled his destiny and defeated the Emperor. Now, did the Padres do that last night? Coming back from eight nothing down, hey, I guess. Kind the of. I mean, Fernando Tatis Jr. is kind of like Luke Skywalker, the chosen one. I would, I would be careful not to overreact either way. As in, if we came on the air today and they had lost this game, because ninety nine percent of the time you do, and all of a sudden you're five and eight, we wouldn't have said season over. Just like off a win like yesterday, you're not saying let's you know print playoff tickets as of yet. It's encouraging. Mm -hmm. It actually speaks in a series of encouraging moments that have played out over these 13 games, even though they're six and seven. I'm reacting to the game in itself being it was an awesome comeback. Oh, it, was it was an it was great. awesome uh, thing to see, to hear Don, to have it be your superstar player that completed the comeback. Your your big names performed Xander Bogarts, Fernando Tatis Jr., um, Jake Cronenworth, right? Like they all came through. It was great to see. I went, yeah, I'm not going to go as far and say as like, this means this team is making the postseason this year. I love them so much. Oh my God. Right. You just got to be, you just got to be somewhere in between. Honestly, from a team perspective, you got to be careful. I would say from a team perspective, not to be swinging sticks of pinatas. True. Which based on what happened last night, I think you what you have to do based on last night is have this belief, like you've been talking about, that, hey, this is possible to be done again. Yep. What happened last night is not going to be our one-off. We're going to do it again, not necessarily from 8 nothing down, 
but from three nothing down yes. or from four nothing down let's do it routinely because a year ago they just weren't that team they Very weren't close. overcoming any deficits forget about eight runs and they trailed by three runs they were going to lose the game two runs it was over it, it felt like that it really did now they've had multiple games this year i said this last night two of their six wins they trailed in the sixth inning or later including yesterday that was massive and there was also the home opener they trailed in the seventh inning to the Giants and came back and, and won the game. So twice. The number I should. They've had an inning of four or more runs. And they didn't have that last year for the 20th game. And just like Sunday's loss, like hurt even more. No, not really. I think it kind of erase it. Well, but here's the thing. It might erase it, but that's also a win they had and they gave away. That's going to happen. We're going to have the because you know what we always say, and but you said like, it. It's like how they gave it away, though. Yeah, but you said it, and I agree with you. You said there's if they miss the postseason by one game, we're going to circle X, Y, or Z. We all say that, right? But nobody's circling the came back from eight nothing down. Yeah, we, I think we will. But if they miss the postseason by one game, you're like, oh, they blew that lead in San Francisco. Yeah, but they won a game this year. Yeah, they missed the postseason by one game. They gave up. That's, a, but that's what I'm saying, but that's like playing poker and saying, man, I lost the worst hand. Well, yeah, you also have two World Series of Poker Championships. Like huh? you're always lo you're looking at it through a lens of why something didn't happen. Yeah. If the Padres this year go 84 and 78 and make the postseason or miss the postseason and miss it by okay. a game, then I'm looking at their losses that they should have exactly. Been but I'm going to tell you, well, they also overcame an eight nothing deficit. But that doesn't matter. Yes, it does because they missed the postseason. I understand that you're missing my point. I think I am. <laughs> yes, exactly. You are missing. <laughs> I think you are missing my I point. I think as well. I am definitely missing your point because I am looking at bottom line, end of the year. They make the postseason by a couple games. Then I'm looking at games like last night. If they miss the postseason by a couple games, I'm not looking at games last night. Do you think if they miss the postseason, serious question, they miss the postseason by one game, you think they make a change? At where? Throughout the organization, just does real change occur if they went 84 and 78 and they lost a tiebreaker or were a game out of the postseason? I know it's hard to answer, right? Because we said it's black or white in or out. Probably not. <laughs> right. If they like just miss out, even though last year they kind of just missed out. Well, they out. just missed out and they got rid of their manager and traded away the best player. Yeah, that was big change. So, yeah. So maybe, maybe it would, <laughs> you know, it, it, Things can't just be like, oh, well, it's okay. We had a good year. Here's a participation trophy. There has to be consequences when things don't happen, when things don't go the way that you are hoping they go or what or need them to go, I should say. Is it a good sign for the Padres what happened three years ago tonight? Plus, Jim's back page coming up this hour as well. Stay with us.
All right. Is it a good omen or not? What happened three years ago tonight? Plus Jim's back page next. All right, this update is brought to you by Taco Bell Padres. Game two of their three-game series with the Cubbies tonight at Petco Park. 7.05 first pitch. Reason why it's 7.05 is because it's a nationally televised game tonight. Joe Musgrove making his three-year anniversary start of his no-hitter for the Padres. He's starting tonight for the Pods against the Cubs. Moving over to the national title game last night, UConn took down Purdue to win back-to-back -back national championships. And Aztecs news of the day, forward Kate Alger has entered the transfer portal. Taco Bell is introducing the new Cantina chicken menu with a new Cantina chicken burrito quesadilla, bowl and tacos featuring their new slow roasted chicken. Try the new Cantina chicken menu today at a participating U.S. Taco Bell location while supplies last. Contact store for our participation, which varies. Programming note, we're expected to have Brian Dutcher with us Thursday at 3 p.m. off the top of John and Jim. I like that. As we look ahead to next season, the role that NIL is playing, Mesa Foundation, remember, I think we said it earlier this week, Mesa Foundation, SD.org. The next $300,000 donations are being matched by an anonymous donor. Love so to hear that. Now is the time. If you're interested in the future of San Diego State men's and women's basketball, the portal is open. Every donation. Uh, going on right now, up to $300,000 being matched at Mesa Foundation SD.org. But Brian Dutcher will join us in studio 3 p.m. on Thursday. So, you know, it was three years ago today. The no hitter by Joe Musgrove. Yeah, how'd you know that? Because I just said in my update. Did you? I really don't listen to your updates. I know you don't. I really don't. I should. It's like They've when you've been getting better. It's like when you talk about net rankings and you talk to I know. bracketologists. I know you don't listen. No, I don't. But, okay. Does that feel like it was longer ago or shorter ago or three years ago? It <laughs> felt like a lifetime ago. That's what I was going to say. Because we were still in the pandemic era with half-filled stadiums. I thought it was five years ago in my head. When I heard three years, I'm like, that was three seasons ago? Yeah, it felt, it felt longer. That's how it felt to me. 2021, the beginning of 2021. And from a franchise moment perspective, that was huge. Wasn't it like other, yeah. we see there's already been a no hitter this year in baseball. Now the other franchises have no hitters, mm -hmm. but didn't it feel like, like a massive moment? It felt like a massive moment because up until that point, it was a huge 
thing that was missing from this franchise. And anytime right. a player got close, everyone moved to the front of their chairs. Oh my God, is this going to be it? I mean, when you go 50 plus years of a franchise, not have one, not have a no hitter, you know, how many That's are crazy. left? How many teams are left? Four or five? Like right now, hand, like a handful of teams. I that... think the answer is zero. No, I'm going to say that there's, there's a, there's at least maybe a handful or less. Can someone, I want to know. Don't that. have no hitters. Not a handful. When I say a handful, I might mean like two or three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to Google. How many teams, teams have not thrown yeah, a no hitter? have not thrown a no hitter. I'm going to say every, th- every team has at least one. Thank you. Uh, the last team was the Padres. Oh. The, Cleveland the, Mets had Gar- the Cleveland Guardians now have the longest active no hitter drought. Oh. Uh, their last no hitter was thrown by you know historic Len Barker. His perfect game on May fifteenth, nineteen eighty one. Okay. Okay. So every team has had one since May fifteenth of nineteen eighty one. Not every team has had a perfect game though. Those are no, way no, no, to way no. This is rare. this guy just happened to get a perfect game, but they're saying yeah. that it's also that no was the team's hundred yeah. percent. perfect game, dude. We're gonna be waiting a long time. For everyone to have a perfect game probably yeah how many have there been in the history of baseball under 20 or 25 like, yeah under 20 maybe and today it's harder with guys on pitch counts yep. and they're not doing it in april yada 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 but but to talk more about that moment it was such a big moment for this franchise because one checked off the you know no hitter column and it was also because of who did it if yeah, it was san diego native if it was some random no-name guy that has a career 70 RA and all of a sudden had a miracle no hit start and you never heard from him again. It would become like a trivia question, like a ball, like, hey, do yeah. you know who the pitch the Padres no hitter? He'd be like, um, like it would take you maybe a second. Right. But this, with it being such a, an important player in franchise history. So you're saying if it was, with all due respect to Matt Waldron, if it was Matt Waldron and correct. he had made six starts for the organization like he did a year ago, correct? that wouldn't have the same level of relevance. Correct. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, this is your comparison. Since 1876, okay. there has been 323 no-hitters mm-hmm. thrown in baseball history. You got a guess perfect. on how many perfects? I say under 30. I say 19. Yeah, I'll say 20. 24. Wow. 24 <laughs> since the 1870s. So in 24 in the history years. of the game, there's only been 24 perfect games, but there's been 323 no hitters. Um, now, is tonight the night? <laughs> I'm going to say no on that no, one. Number 25 happens to but, it also, but it's interesting because it's Musgrove tonight anyway. But now it takes away that, like, every game the Padres pitch, oh, Guess no, no hitter tonight. Oh, guess no, no hitter tonight. Yeah, we used to always do that, right? There goes the no hitter. Yeah, exactly. There goes the no hitter. No that, one cares about that, that anymore. Ernie's thing. No one, no one cares. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, no one cares about that anymore. Even, even a perfect game, it's like who cares? Because those are so hard to get. Does it feel less significant in general the no yes. hitter now that the Padres yes. have grabbed one? Like, is the is the next one gonna? It would be big, but it wouldn't be as big as yeah. the last. Yeah, one. Yeah, it would definitely be big. Because yeah. it's always you know the first, the first is always the most memorable. Like I remember a couple of years ago, Odris Amir Despagne was about to throw a no hitter, mm-hmm. and you're like, "Who? Huh? Right?" And I forget someone else had a really good game for the Padres. Oh yeah, they've had some guys, and it was like the eighth inning. Yep, and he was pitching really well, and I was there, and I forget the guy's name. He was a right. total no name guy, and I'm like, "Is this going to be the guy that's going to be the first to throw point. a Padres no hitter?" Yeah. So it could not happen to a better person. It could not happen to a more perfect player like the fit was perfect san diego kid grew up you know watching the padres grew up padres fan and he throws the first no hitter in padres history like it was perfect i mean you think about musgrove's first couple of years and hopefully who he is for the rest of this five-year deal like he was he was among the better starting pitchers in baseball his first two years and then last year had the injuries he's also really good while he was out there he was when he was out there this year is still very early but, I mean, you're kind of counting on him, five-year deal, $100 million, to be the guy that he was in 2021 and well, 2022. Yeah. If I just look here at Joe's last three years with the Padres. Yeah, overall numbers with the Padres. Not counting whoops, not counting this season. Well, you can count it. Well, Maybe you can yeah. count it, but it's also. All right, so here we go. Um, 31 wins. It's not showing me the overall ERA, but 
a 318 ERA in 2021, a 293 ERA in 2022, a 305 ERA last year. He's an all-star. What are you looking at? I'm looking Dude, at baseball reference. Baseball yeah. Right oh, I'm an idiot. Four years. <laughs> uh, 32 and 20, 3, 3.15 ERA. <laughs> That's great. All right. 474 total innings pitched. He's an all-star. Um, has that big playoff moment against the Mets yeah. in game three. Dude, yeah, yeah so far he's, so far he's produced, and I think he's going to produce again this year. And he'll probably, I think I said this a couple of years ago, he might go down as one of the best Padres pitchers in the history of the franchise. So you're not, you have no concern over 6.28 and three starts, no, no. 14 to third innings, 20 hits. No. Either do I. No. Either, And he pitched well his last time out. I don't either. I'm going to give him time here. He He finished last year hurt. It was up and down last year because of injury. I'll give him. I'll give him more than four starts. Tonight's his fourth start. I'll give him more than that. Yep. Oh, and he's killed the Cubs over his career too. Oh, has he? His career ERA against the Cubs is like two point oh six, something like that. It's low. All right, okay. underdog. underdog. <laughs> I was about to say, open up that app. Underdog. Okay. All right, lower. <laughs> Love it. Right. Lower, higher, right. higher. Lower everything. And earn runs for yeah. Joe Musgrove tonight. It's game two, by the way, of a three-game series. Padres Cubs tonight, seven oh five. See if the Padres can replicate some of the magic from yesterday, but hopefully they don't fall behind eight nothing. Like maybe they just jump out to an eight nothing lead and they win the game eight nothing. You know what? Screw it. Go down eight nothing. Maybe that's again. the only way they can do it now. <laughs> yeah. No, not screw it, dude. You're, you're they're so desensitized yeah. now. If they can't come back from eight runs, yeah. it's not even worth it. See if we can do it again. Can you imagine? No, I I I wonder how I, often I, that's ever happened in baseball history. Back to back game, someone's overcome an eight run deficit or larger. Maybe like one time ever. Well, I know that if it happens, we'll we'll find out the team that did it. We will probably. <laughs> yeah, we will. Thanks to Elias. Um. By the way, have we gotten any text today? Yes, the text line is open, John. Oh, by the way, is who put the Len Barker's perfect game was five innings, Brent? Rain can't. Yeah, he's he's taking it back though. He was wrong. Oh, okay. Oh. It was nine innings. Six one nine number says Star Wars is a galaxy far away, not a universe. I don't know what the what's the difference. Um. A galaxy is part of a universe. True. A gal. So are we? A gal okay. So like we're, we're the Milky in, Way it'd be, galaxy. It'd be, it'd be like a block is part of a city. A galaxy is part of the universe. So is Star Wars in our universe? No. It's in an alternate universe. It's in the multiverse. A different galaxy and a different galaxy too. And a galaxy far, far away. John. It's right in the name. Okay. All right. Jim's back page is next.
All right, on the other side, Jim's back page. That is next. All right, again, a programming announcement. Sean Lewis was in the studio with Big Rich Indian Fletch. If you missed that, sportsd.com or the iHeartRadio app. And Brian Dutcher will join us in studio Thursday at 3 p.m. Love it. So be listening for that. Of course, we're back with you tomorrow at 3 as well, getting you ready for a series finale between the Padres and the Cubs. Does anybody know why tomorrow's start time is what it is? For the I Padres. asked you about today, and you looked at me like I was an idiot. Well, that makes more sense if it's 7.05. I know why. Why? It typically wouldn't be 340. Normally, getaway day, they play earlier, right? At home, they like play, what, 1, the 110 10, Yeah. But hear me out. Chicago's not heading east. They're staying west. So there's not as much as a priority of playing early, right? Are they going to Seattle, Brent? Are the Cubs going to Seattle? They're either going to Seattle or Arizona. Okay. My point is it's 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 an easy jaunt. Seattle. So you're two hours away. Game ends at seven. And they don't play till Friday. Six thirty. Oh, they'll play till Friday. What? Yeah, they got so, they got Thursday off. Oh, then why aren't the Padres playing at night? Dude, I don't know. Right? That is weird. A three forty start time. No. They, they both have Thursday off. Cubs and the uh, Bruce. Cubs and the right. Padres, Padres will be in Thursday. LA. And tomorrow is the Manny Machado bobblehead day. At three forty? Yeah. Are you sure, dude? Yes. I'm looking at you like you have five heads. I know I you are. Wrong. I think you're wrong. I think I'm right. I want to say you're wrong. I think I'm 100% right on this one. You're so right. Rich McGuire. Why are they playing at 340? Can someone please text us or call us? Why are you playing the game at 340, Padres? How could you have a Machado Bobble at a three in the afternoon? On a Wednesday. Is it a holiday? No. Machado Day? Why would it be a holiday on a Wednesday? Good point. Why are they playing at 340? Either play at one or play at like 640. I would play at 640 because you probably get more people going to that. I mean, you're going to get yeah. a sellout tomorrow. Right. It's Machado. Machado bobblehead. But like, is it a sellout though? For people, for people that are like working or like kids that are going to school, if they're even in school still, I don't know. That's a weird start yeah. time. Yeah. Weird start That's time. That's a really weird start. Anybody time. have an idea on that text line? Yeah. Please like call us. All right. Let's, let's get to it. Just text me.
So you know how last week I was talking about um, Caitlin Clark and her, the chairs that she like briefly sat in going up for sale for big time money. Well, a chair that Caitlin Clark sat in for player introductions during the Big Ten tournament has been sold. Are you listening? I'm not. Okay. It has been sold for <laughs> for three thousand. $722. So a chair that Caleb Clark just sat in for introductions because she played the whole game sold for over $3,500. These chairs normally sell for like 200, 300 bucks. The Caitlin Clark effect in full in force. Full, well, we talked about that actually maybe earlier in the week about the chair, didn't we? We did. Yeah. And this officially sold for $3,700. Dude, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. I thought it was going to sell for like hundred bucks. Well, it didn't. I thought wrong. I thought wrong. You did think wrong. Um, coming out of WrestleMania this weekend, John, they were dubbing it the biggest WrestleMania of all time. Listen to these freaking numbers. Okay. All right? So, this was streamed on Peacock. This was Peacock's most streamed entertainment event of all time, across both nights, Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. The show was viewed. Like we talk about views for our wrap yep. up show. How many times? 1.3 billion minutes. I don't know what that means though, because when I watch the Super Bowl, they're not like, hey, a billion minutes. When we go to our analytics for our when YouTube we see page, hours. we see hours watch time. I know, but it's I like 500 don't... hours of watch time. Well, that's how they probably right. do it for okay. the metrics here. Okay. Um, and it resulted in the second biggest usage weekend for a P for peacock of all time ranking only behind the nfl wildcard game um this past year wow okay behind the wildcard game of course makes sense Kansas so City you're talking like 20 plus million 25 million people for both nights wow equaling about 50 million people watching wait how do we know that is that what they said based on the minutes well if i'm just looking at uh the wild card game for the for January. How many viewers was that? That was, I think, twenty six or twenty seven million. And they said this is second to that. Second to that. But is that both nights adding up or it's, one night? Well, it's both nights, but each. I night need more data, Jim. Basically, John, it was viewed by a lot of people. I didn't see it. I know you didn't see it, Brent. Did you see it? Yes. Okay. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you have? Um. This was also, and we're talking about Joe Musgrove, uh, the anniversary day for his no hitter. Guess what happened on this day in 1975? This day in 1975, what? It was the debut of Ernie's favorite mascot, the San Diego Chicken. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, 50 years ago. That's right. On this day, 1975. And wasn't the whole premise like, hey, give me a dollar for every ticket I sell. I'm going to sell out Jack Murphy. I don't know. I wasn't around back then. And he like hatched out of an egg. Yeah. He did hatch out of an egg. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're like, yo, every ticket I'm making up over 10,000, right? We, we get 10, we get 15 K every ticket over 15 K. I could be wrong. We Someone interviewed correct me him. if I'm wrong. Did I? Were you still here? Or, or was, were you, was that before when it was just no Steven? Uh, I don't remember. Rich, but we, cause he was in studio in the costume. We but interviewed him. The idea the was like, Hey, I'll sell. I can sell tickets. So like, all right, we'll give you a dollar for every ticket sold. And he sold like 30 or 40,000 seats. And they gave him like 30 or 40 or 50 K for the one night. Hmm. Cause he was the KGB chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. What's he up to now? Not is he still much. is he still he's still I think performing? He's, I don't know. I think he still does mascotting. I think he still goes across the country. Okay. I but for a I, while he was like, was he the unofficial or the official Padres mascot? He was the unofficial, I think. He might have been the official. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't keep up. Would you take him back? No, you don't like the. Well, you're gonna kick the fryer out. No, you have two. You have both mascots. I don't know. Who you have, Mister Met. You have Mrs. Met. True. Would but, you take him back or no? Um, I always thought the chicken was relatively cool. I like yeah, the chicken. All right. Chicken's great. Yeah. All right. So there you go. That's everything. That's it all. It's all, wow, John. Man. There's only so much we could get to in the back page. That was good. I'll give you three stories, and you didn't appreciate any of them. I wasn't listening for the first two. I know you weren't. That's why you're like, we don't have any more. I'm like, I've given you three. <laughs>
I'll give you three quality stories for today. Okay, nobody has texted in with why they're playing tomorrow at 340. But I feel like between now... I don't think anyone knows. Yeah, that's the thing. I think we'll find out tomorrow. I'm going to ask people. No, you're not. Yeah, I will. I'm going to ask. I'm going to text Kevin AC right now. Our Padres insider. Sure he'd know. This is why he. This is why we employ him. Right. Why we have him on every Why week. is this game being played at 340? Why do the Padres play games at this time? Exactly. That's all I want to know. All right, we're back tomorrow at 3. Join us tonight for a wrap-up show. And again, if you missed anything today, sportssd.com, iHeartRadio app, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, or Spotify. You can find us on social media at John and Jim. J-O-N-A-N-D-J-I-M. On the other side, Sports Talk Radio, presumably, <laughs> for Brent and Jim. Lakers Warriors. Oh, Lakers Warriors. Was that in your update? No. Nice job. Lakers Warriors at 645. For Brent and Jim, I'm John. Keep it here at San Diego Sports 760. He's no brother. <laughs>